Hopefully. Really is frustrating because I've maxed absolutely every setting out here. Really is frustrating because I've maxed absolutely I told you about the last time here. I was on Charles' stream where he had my mic not even playing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess while, uh, while Jason is sorting out his audio, how does mine sound? We've had a bit of difficulty with audio today, so when people let me know if they can hear me clearly, that would be helpful. Okay, and can you hear me now? Hopefully that's a little bit better. Oh, apparently you're unmuted now, so that's a good, a good sign. All right, sounding a little bit better. Okay, cool. Um, anyway, welcome everybody. Sorry, it took us a little bit. We were trying to get the audio working and kind of leveled nice. and hopefully it, it sounds all right. Um, so today we were going to go over questions. Um, so to take questions from everybody in chat, if you guys have stuff you want to ask, um, Unity related programming stuff, game dev stuff, um, anything about that. And then there were a couple different topics that I wanted to talk about a little bit later. So um, maybe we can dive into those after we've hit a couple questions or just gone over stuff that Jason wants to dive into first. Um, yeah, anyway, just thanks again, by the way, Jason, for being on here. Oh, I know the first thing that we need to talk about, though. Oh, wait, no, hold on. Before we jump into the first thing, the, the thing before the first thing, um, everybody that's watching, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share the video. Last time we streamed, we didn't get that many likes. It was a really great stream, too. Anyway, don't forget to do that. Now, on to the actual first thing of the, the stream was, um, did you create your YouTube channel yet, Jason? It is actually in progress. So progress is being made. I'm not um, sure what that means. <laughs> that, well, okay. Let, let me be more elaborate. I have a, a script written for a couple of videos and a friend of mine who's an artist is working on some 3D models to assist with some examples for my first couple of videos. So it is coming along slowly but surely. It's just going to be a case of finding time to actually record and do the editing and so on. So um, the, the first few topics will be covering uh, interface segregation, um, something like command patterns and design patterns. And effectively, uh, I guess for lack of a better word, we're, uh, we're going to look at using how to make a smart house for your virtual game. So effectively, imagine making a game which has a smart house in it. So that's my, my first idea. I thought it'd be a fun experiment. Oh, OK. That sounds cool. Is this like a um, third person or first person smart house? or um, Probably first person. I have, a, I have a 3D model controller I've gotten made, which has little button animations and things that might be fun to see up close so okay cool sounds interesting it's so be like... just a giant excuse to have uh um a series of interfaces for various commands but it, I, I thought i might make it a bit more fun than just writing code so we'll see yeah. how that goes so. i think that'd be really cool and you could do some really neat stuff with lighting controllers in there and stuff um and yeah. you can just move anything right like you can do all kinds yeah of yeah i want to have like the, the equivalent of a tv and a radio and smart lights and you can do all the uh, stuff that you do with an unlimited yeah. budget. <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah. All the stuff that I would do behind me if I had an unlimited budget. <laughs> right. Oh, man. That sounds really cool. Dude. Well, um, is the channel already up so people can go sub subscribe now before the videos are ready? Well, my channel is just my name. It's Jason Story. So um, there's no videos on it yet, but you're welcome to go and have a look. It's the one that I plugged before for my playlist. So I might as well relink it if anybody's interested. Yeah, you're gonna link it in uh, in chat real quick. Everybody sure, can go get it. subscribed and get ready for the uh, the series because I'm sure that's gonna be fun. Let me it sounds see if interesting. I can find it, right? And it sounds like a great use for um, quite a few different design patterns, and like a really yeah, obvious cool. use for them because you have the whole um, uh, like commands. You're sending commands directly to a device and. 
I think of quite and a I few others. I kind of felt like I, I, I wanted something that hits more games, you know, because I kind of feel like a lot of the problems we have explaining these topics is they're all very um, conceptual and vague, right? And I kind of wanted to show somebody uh, something that really hits home to game systems. And one of the most common things you do in a lot of standard first-person games these days is you have interactable house elements. You know, stuff like flushing the toilet and turning on the taps and pressing on on the radio. But I thought that's something that if you are new to those kinds of concepts, I can demonstrate how to make almost anything you want interactable. You know, drawers that open and close or any sort of little thing around that, that you want to sort of make a, a house more interactive, like light switches. Make light switches that turn on, but will also interact with other elements by turning on lights and that kind of thing. Yeah. I think it's cool. I think it'll be fun. I want to see it. Uh, well, there's my channel at the moment. I don't even know if that's coming through. I seem to be even blocked last time, so you might have to paste it yourself. It's okay. No, you're intentionally blocked. Here. Yeah. I don't want your spam here, mister. Um, no, it's, it's not blocking anything. I don't know. It doesn't show anything. Well, um, I, I see it there for me, but... Interesting. Well, I'll I'll paste it right into chat, and I'll put it into the um, the video description right now, so everybody. Uh, as for when I'm going to begin, later, the unfortunate answer is when I have time. Chat. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's my channel. Now, again, this is just my playlist. So what I do is whenever I find interesting or valuable videos, I tend to put them into categorized playlists. So, um, my my channel is still up and coming in terms of I'm still producing videos for it. But in the meantime, there are hundreds and hundreds of hours of very valuable education in those lists of playlists on my channel. So feel free to watch those to tide you over. Nice. Yeah, and go just subscribe real quick so you can see the, the new stuff when it comes out. And yes, you can watch the stream later. Um, so did you want to dive into taking some questions first? Um, or was there something sure. else you want to talk about before we do that? No, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good to answer any questions anybody has. We can... I'm sure we'll, I'll come up with things I want to talk about as we go, I guess. Okay. Well, let's see. Um, should we just jump over to a, oh, I see a, a very important question. Why do you wear your glasses on this stream, but not on infallible code? What's going on That's there, a Jason? Question. I don't know. I, li I like to shake things up. You know? <laughs> it's a different guessing. Jason. <laughs> Let's see. Um, can you touch on Unity freelancing? That since one of the things I want to talk about today was remote work, just because a lot of people are doing it. I think that's a great first question to jump onto. I know there are some up above, and we'll try to dive back through and hit a bunch of them. But um, I think it'd be interesting to talk briefly about freelancing if you're up for it. Sure. I know you do quite a bit of it, right? And I don't do so much of it now, but I have in the past. So I'd be curious to see. Um, What's I will say, are? though, things are, are slowing down recently, uh, mostly to do with the kinds of projects I used to do were a lot more VR and AR. And the VR stuff has mostly gone by the wayside. People aren't really looking for VR projects anymore. And the AR stuff is kind of more long-form projects. So I used to do a lot of one-month or two-month contracting jobs. but They don't really happen as much these days. Um, the, the stuff that is still there usually has sort of trickled off now, especially with the uh, um, people not going to events. Because a yeah. lot of the work I would do are around building prototypes that would go to a CES or go to a, um, you know, GDC or something. So right. people aren't looking for these things to be made if they're not going to these events. So unfortunately, now is not a great time to be a, a contractor of that sort. I have other stuff, though, so I'm not actually worried myself. But um, I know people who are. <laughs> I'll put it that way. Oh, that's understandable. I hadn't even thought about that yet. Um, just the uh, the concerns from you know, all, everything getting canceled and how that was going to impact. Because, I mean, it's also going to impact people that are doing a lot of the contract work for all the other in-person places. And that's where a lot of it's for, right? It's all these um, smaller places where people go. And I guess a lot of that is probably put on pause or canceled, at least temporarily. So, yeah, that's, mm. that's rough. Hey, Frank. So I, I've known him for a very, very long time. He sent me to Disneyland like a week ago. I think he got me sick and infected. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think that was my dog. When was the last time you did contracting work like that then? I'm curious. Um, 
goodness, it's been, I don't know, maybe a year or so. Um, I used to do it qu quite often. Like I'd have you know one or two, sometimes three at a time while I was mm -hmm. doing other stuff. Um, That's and then I kind of slowed down. It to, in between other stuff you're doing. Yeah. I pretty much slowed down to one um one at a time and then you know the weird thing is like i don't even consider like the other game dev stuff which is technically contract work too like i don't even think of it that way like as a contract because it's so long term it's just you know, multi-year stuff um huh. but i get like the actual small projects it's it's probably been about a year and they would usually go i would say like anywhere between one month to three mm -hmm. on the, the shorter ones. Um, but they're fun. They're you know pretty quick um, and get to do interesting things and usually find that's some thing, yeah. new problem, right? There that's, always be that's some... one thing I like the most. They let you learn crazy new technologies. Most, most of the contracting jobs I've done have been fundamentally different things than what I would normally do. And I always come away from one of them with some new skill set or some new library i now know that i didn't before you know yeah i'd say I, i'm the same way and i think that a lot of the time with them um the ones that are super super simple you kind of have that opportunity to look into some new technology and see if it, it will fit in there you know when they're ex just extremely simple projects so some of them they are they're you know like it's you know make this thing drag over there and then light up and show a particle that's Painting's a big one. I've noticed a lot of companies pretty. like painting. They like like apps where you have to like draw things in the sky or or paint onto models and things. That's a that's a common request I've gotten. Yeah. So what about the um, I guess the process of freelancing though. So when when you've done it yourself, how have you found people? Um, over here, let me just briefly give my mine because it's very very short and simple. Um, almost all of the freelancing that, are, and no, all of the freelancing that I've done has been a referral from somebody I knew or somebody reaching out to me. It's either been like, um, a friend of a friend was looking for something. So they sent him over to me. Um, mm -hmm. and then as the kind of grew YouTube channel and other stuff, it also just started getting people contacting me. But I'd say most of it is just like friends of friends. It's all referrals and that stuff. I don't think I've ever gone out and actually searched for a contract job myself or like gone out like hunting contact, contract jobs. See, I'm, I'm really glad you said that because I'm exactly the same. Oh. I have never gone looking for contract work. It's just I've made friends with a lot of people in a lot of different communities, from VR communities to just Reddit communities to various different online forums and discords and um, Slack groups, and people reach out to me. So I can honestly say I have never, no, that's not true. Twice at a meetup, I handed out my card with the intent of reaching out for work. And that's in like an eight year history of doing this is that I don't, I don't have to look for it because in general, if you know enough people, people hear about projects that need to get done and they refer them to you. So yeah. I'm the same. So it's, it's unfortunate. I can very rarely give advice on how do you find contract work because it tends I've actually to find done the, the same with cards. Uh, when you say that, like, I think like I, I actually have, I ordered a bunch of them and I've given out like maybe this many, but it was at meetups, right? At meetups when I first got them all excited. I'm like, yeah, you know, yeah. But yeah, now I don't even know where they are. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, that's why my, my advice is normally when people ask me, how do, how do I find contract work? The unfortunate truth is, it's like, I can't tell you how you can go out and find work. All I can say is if you meet enough people, the law of averages will be in your favor. You know, you'll, you'll have more people who will potentially need work, who will know your name, who might potentially reach out. And so. I guess that's even kind of harder now with, um, with everything being canceled. Like there are no meetups, nothing's going on. Like, um, I don't know how you, like discord is one option, but it's not mm. like a very, um, organized option or anything if only someone would set up some kind of online meetup for programmers what do you think jason that's that not yeah, a good well, idea we have the the one but it's mostly focused on like high level stuff i feel like maybe we just put together like a big monthly thing that's just like a big one where 
a bunch of people come in and it's not just um open mic but more like a presentation and opportunities for people to talk about because so when i've gone to meetups here and i don't know if they're the same um where you are but in general like the structure is pretty simple there's a person that runs the meetup and they'll go up there at the beginning or normally before they'll like start they'll they're giving out pizza and drinks and stuff right Mm -hmm. and people are walking around networking just talking it's totally open just a bunch of pizza on the table drinks there and people randomly talking to each other um then they'll start the guy that runs it um the one i'm thinking of a guy named andrew would go up to the front he'd um, pull up a little presentation start talking about what the group was for where it came from um and then you would start looking to see if anybody was um, looking to hire, right? And then anybody that had job openings would just stand up to say what they had available or what they were trying to hire, like what the, the requirement, basically like give a little info about what it was they were trying to hire. Usually it would actually be recruiters. So it'd be like technical recruiters. Sometimes it would be um, just developers. Like I'd, I'd occasionally have them like, hey, we need... Um, this specific type of developer, um, if you happen to be it or you know somebody you'd recommend, you know, come talk to me after. And then you just talk after. So, um, And then they'd go into a talk after that, right? So go through that whole thing. Or other people could stand up and introduce themselves um, if they were looking for a job, right? Um, which may not work in an online one. But I think having people um, at least be able to say if they're looking to hire people or something. And then going into talks and some networking or something might be really interesting. I don't know. It sounds fun. Um, it's totally just popping into my head now, but. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, it took me. And, and to, to be honest, uh, when you're talking about meetups, like in terms of how they, how they've been for me, well, I'll be honest, I've only been to five or six and that's mostly because there just aren't that many. And the ones that I go to are usually the same two or three meetups every two or three months. Like there's one here hosted by Logitech where they talk about the latest in VR stuff. Um, and that's fun, but it's, again, it's like every three to four months. It's not a common occurrence. Um, it's just not that many meetups. So I, I, that's why a lot of the meetup I've been doing has been online through Slack and Discord and that kind of thing. Because Ireland in general, just there's not a lot going on in terms of um, programming groups. Like even near me now in Cork, which is one of the largest cities in Ireland, um, second largest, I think. And it's, I've only been able to find JavaScript groups, lots of JavaScript groups, but there's just very little in terms of uh, .NET development. There's nothing for Unity development. There's just no groups in, you know, Ireland's second largest city. So um, the, the more online groups, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Huh. Okay, yeah, um, I'm excited. So I think we'll do it. I'm just set something up and do like a um, a big, I don't know, like a big monthly meetup with a designated talk about something and some sort of uh chat so people can just kind of get together and talk and uh meet each other and maybe introduce some jobs i don't know i think it'd be fun okay um so neither one of us has really good advice on how to get hired other than sorry um come to this meetup that i'm going to put together um but I, I think it'll be fun so maybe we can do it and um it's a simple enough thing i just gotta figure out like a talk um a speaker basically and figure out who can give a presentation and then yeah i'll figure it out I'll, I'll try to get it figured out tomorrow let's talk some more tomorrow too yeah that's good cool okay um there's so let's hop on to another question up. yeah there's been a couple that have popped up that i want to cover i'll let and you two pick. of them are actually quite long so all right you <laughs> pay, just... pick pick your favorite one there's so many that i've kind of lost track to so the first one is i've seen the word mvvm pasted by multiple people in multiple questions so this is a very big topic I'd like to jump on. So for people who aren't familiar with it, MVVM stands for uh, model view, view model. And it's an architectural pattern. It's actually, it's a composite design pattern. So that's where you take a number of design patterns and push them together to make sort of a more elaborate one. Um, it sort of lives in the same family as MVC, you might've heard of, model view controller, and MVP, uh, model view presenter. And there's others too, but those, those ones will cover pretty much most fundamental architecture. And it basically boils down to how do you separate the obvious layers in your application? Now, I really want to put a pause here and and really focus on this because this is extremely important. All of these patterns are designed to solve a particular problem with changing architecture. 
So if you are building a application that sits on a desktop, like a banking application, there are three areas of that that matter. There is the data where you're storing it and how you recall it. There is the area of business rules. In other words, what can or can't you do with that account? So can you, so here's where the bank account lives. And over here is, is a bank account allowed to go into the negatives? Is there a rule of how much is the, is the maximum amount of money in an account? Or is there certain kinds of um, transfers are not allowed between certain kinds of accounts? That's the middle layer. That's control in general. And then you've got presentation, which is purely representing the data that lives in the, in the presentation layer, in the persistence layer through the control rules into presentation. So this general thing splits across most applications. In almost every application you make, there'll be some data stored somewhere. There'll be some rules about what can or can't happen to that data. And there'll be some way you're drawing that data onto the string. And all of these patterns are designed to choose a different place to draw that line. So depending on how much information you need and how decoupled things need to be, you will pick different patterns. So if you're very likely to change your backend, you're going to change between SQL or NoSQL, or you're going to have a local version um, stored in flat files, and then you might switch to a web service, you want the persistence portion, the data models, to be able to be swapped out easily. And that's where you might pick something that draws a line at that point. So MVC being a good example. And once you move up, it comes down to the question of what are you doing with that data? In some applications, you're basically uh, rendering it, and there's very little logic involved. And so for that, you can use uh, something with, say, model and a view model, because then what you're doing is you're taking that data, adding a couple of bits of extra fields, and then displaying it. But if you're doing more complex stuff, you might have an entire control layer that separates between the control and the presentation. And the reason you do that is because you might want to deploy the same application on multiple platforms. So if you do that, you want to keep the same models, the same controls and rules, but you might want to change how it looks. And I don't mean just visually like changing the style. I mean, you might have to use a different graphics library. So if you're, if you're using the same rules, you might deploy on a different platform. And so you might have to use their rendering library. And a good example of stuff like this would be, uh, it may not seem like it, but in an application, the file system can be part of the presentation layer. So if you're accessing a local file system, you get files, read them, and then push them into some sort of persistent storage. How you will interact with that uh, files for the most part, is sort of a mix between control and presentation logic because it comes down to how do you represent the getting of that data and how do you feed it into the controls, which will apply business rules to it, and then eventually save it into the database. So after all of that being said, the questions that are being asked is how do you use it in Unity and have you tried implementing it in particular ways? And here's where I want to put a really big asterisk to all of that. By, by design, that's a three-layered architecture. That is having a series of data going through some layer, which has some overhead costs, into some control layer, which applies some rules, which has some costs, which goes into presentation layer, which does some stuff, displays it. And then again, there's some cost to all of these layers. Each one of these are wrapped functions and interfaces and that kind of a thing. And games are not event-driven. So unlike an event-driven application where you can have these three layers, you you're only calling that, like if I click a button, I will then call through the layers, get some data and bring it back and display it. I'm only doing that pipeline walk every time I click a button. But if I'm doing a game, I'm doing that layered walk 60 times a second or more. And so all of a sudden that decision to have an MVC style architecture starts to really come into question about how valuable it is to draw those lines if you're going to be paying for it multiple times a second just to have that separation of concern. So the short answer to that is you should only use something like MVC or MVVM or MVP or whatever if the intention is to use it in an event-driven way. So it's a good candidate for things like views and or any kind of visual representation, something that will literally show up, wait for input, respond to input, and leave again. So I will use it if I have an app which reads from a web API, for example, but it should not be used in anything that falls into an update loop. So we can go into more detail about it and how you would apply it and various different things, but that's the most important part. Do not apply an event-driven architecture to a loop-driven architecture. You will end up paying for it 
in terms of massive performance issues and lots of unnecessary architecture. At least that's my opinion on the matter. So I kind of went on for a bit there, Jason. I apologize. <laughs> no, it's all good. I, I had to step away for half a second anyway, so it worked out perfect. Um, I thought it was interesting. So do you use MVVM in any of your actual projects now? I like, use MVP a lot, but okay. I use it exclusively for things like notification pop-ups and for... Uh, I actually use it for micro components. So if I if I recognize there's a there's an input box for example, an input box has a bunch of display logic. So it is receiving some input from a user. There's an a go button effectively. There's a feedback as to whether there was validation issues, and there's possibly feedback as to how many results returned. I would use an MVP style architecture for just that small component because how I feed information into that input box, say for example, it's autocomplete, mm -hmm. might come from one source or a different source. How I, uh, the rules I apply, whether, whether you're allowed to have longer than three characters or whether you're allowed to use certain swear words or whatever, those are the controller layer. And then presentation might change drastically depending on uh, whether I'm drawing it using a text mesh pro input box or a normal input box or whether I'm going to use voice controls or whatever. So long story short, if it's a component with a sufficient amount of logic, I would encapsulate that component in something that looks a lot like MVP so that I can drop it into a new project and just swap out the visual portion and keep like 90% of the logic. Okay, but not MVVM and it's really just at a component library level because that's where you're finding that you actually do the swapping. Yeah, I was thinking the same much. thing because I, I don't use either really anymore um i remember when i first learned about mvvm and i got very very excited and i started using it in a place where it made a lot of sense and then yeah. i started trying to shove it into my unity projects where it made no sense at all and it overcomplicated yeah. everything it confused everybody that worked on it including myself and it made things take five to ten times longer for zero yeah. I, I got no benefit out of it at all and literally just kind of like stalled up the stuff I was doing because I was trying to shove this um, thing that fit really, really well into another scenario where like the whole ecosystem was built around it um, and then trying to port it over into Unity thinking like, oh, it works so well here. You know, but without mm -hmm. all of the automatic wiring and all of the, the magic that's there to support MVVM, I'd say it's, um, it's very difficult. <laughs> you know? And, yeah, and, if, and if it doesn't give you... A very good payoff right unless you're doing yeah I, I unless you're actually taking advantage of the swapping stuff like i would avoid it for your projects in general but not for i think that control libraries like you're saying make a lot of sense though yeah because in in realistic terms like a lot of the places you'd use mvvm would be something like wpf application because there's a lot of pre-built architecture to support things like relay commands various ways to um or or not or i notification property change right you have various ways to have automatic bindings and hookups for various event firing and if you want to implement something like mvvm yourself you're going to have to write an entire notification dispatching type system you're going to have to deal with a lot of plumbing and architecture for again as jason said very little value like it comes down to the fact of a lot of this stuff i'm talking about don't apply things that don't give you value like that's the point of it and it can feel very tempting to take a pattern that you use at work in a different environment and think it works here i'll apply it over here and it really really doesn't work the rules are completely different like the, the environment is different the goals are different it's in, instead of trying to you know pick up a hammer and look for a nail ask yourself what problem you're solving and figure out the right tool for the job yeah i i 100 agree and it looks like other people have had some similar results too. We're not the only ones. <laughs> um, well, is there another question that you wanted to jump over to? Uh, there was one, but there's been so much conversation, it's kind of lost it in the theme. So you jump, you jump into one next, and I'll I'll keep looking for for the one I I missed. Am I cold? Yes. There you go. Another question answered, right? No, it's just, I'm freezing. I don't know. I think I might be sick, actually, to be honest. So I, I think I'm going to be stuck inside and not going anywhere because I'm pretty sure I'm sick. I feel like an ice cube. And it's 
sunny and bright outside. Right? <laughs> it's probably 70 in here. Um, so let's see. What? Hmm. I'm not sure which. Here's one actually. Here, here's I found the one I was looking for. Okay. Uh, it said that you shouldn't use an abstract class if you don't have base logic. So I moved my code to an interface. However, injecting interfaces is difficult with the serialized field attribute. Yes. So how do I inject interfaces? Well, this is one of those things where I would say, don't fight Unity <laughs> if you don't have to. And if your goal is to drag something into an inspector field for binding, I will often use effectively an empty abstract class and treat it like an interface. Not because it's how I would ideally do it, but because it gives me the benefits of being able to drag that thing in into the inspector if yeah. I will be extending from mono behavior. Otherwise, what's probably the most common solution to the problem you're describing is I actually put the script on either the same object and then I will call get component in a wake to grab it or I will have a sort of uh, implicit rule where you drag in a game object object, just a game object and then you call get component and grab the component off of it. And if the component doesn't exist, uh, I would fire a debug log warning that would say the object you provided in this field doesn't have the appropriate interface type I need. Um, again, it's not ideal, but it's working around limitations of Unity. There's that new serialized um, field attribute, serialized component, I forgot what it's called, serialized reference attribute in Unity. I haven't used it yet, so I'm not entirely sure how good it is. But again, think about it practically about what your goal is. If it's if your goal is to be able to reference objects by an interface, there's a load of ways you can kind of cheat and get around it. Uh, and like I said, the most common example I would use would be have a game object which acts as a host, and I would call get component or get components in children for all of the children of the object. So I would treat an object as this is my holder, and every game object underneath it, I will assume it'll have that interface I need. And I will grab an array of that object and I will then act on it as I need. Yeah, that's exactly how I would do it too. Instead of using the serialized field, just having a, a, a get component in the awake. Um, in fact, I was going to show, let's see if I get muted here. Oh, and by, and by the way, uh, as Kian said, it's actually, no, it's not serialized field I'm talking about. It's literally serialized reference. That is a different attribute. It's a new one that's added in 2019 that technically allows you to serialize interfaces. So that's the one I'm referring to. I haven't tried that one yet, so I'm not entirely sure if it works. But yeah, that's how it works, yeah, I should say. Code that I was just showing was um, just showing where you do that get component type call that he was talking about, too. Yeah. Um, sorry, that was uh, the uh, the scenes are a little bit messed up. I had to reinstall Windows twice over the last week, so um, OBS setup's a little bit weird and messed up. And uh, I thought we had it all fixed, but we'll, we'll stay. I, on I still can't now. figure this stuff out. In fact, actually, I should probably mention that now. There's a small chance my camera at some point will just switch to pitch black because I haven't figured out how to use the damn thing properly yet. So just just a word of warning. I might have to go and fiddle with some wires later if that drops out. It just randomly goes to black. <laughs> Well, it seems to be timing out in video mode. So it seems to be running out, assuming it's probably recording video. So I need to find a way to get it to stop doing that. I've gone yeah, into the settings and tape, I can't dude. seem to. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Confusing stuff. That's fine. All right. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, I think you kind of answered that one, though. Just generally avoiding using serialized field for anything that doesn't have to be a mono behavior um, is yeah. is usually the way to go. But if you have to do that reference, making it a mono behavior, is, um, it's fine for doing that. It, it makes sense. Um, and, and I think something that uh, Jason said earlier, well, it's, it's funny. We've had this discussion before, and I'm pretty sure, unless I'm wrong, Jason, your favorite pattern is still the humble object, right? Um, that's the I one, don't know. That's the one you, you, you've definitely mentioned a lot as one of your favorites. It's it's up there. Uh, so that, that's one that's a very good candidate for this kind of a thing. So a lot of the stuff you have to do in Unity to get around these problems boils down to limitations of a component model. 
So without going into uh, the, the complex architecture that is a component model, let's just say Unity aren't insane and they didn't make bad decisions. A lot of this stuff to do with the component model serve a very good purpose and you're getting a lot of free magic you may not know you're getting. And until we do a video someday that breaks down exactly what that magic is, uh, just take it for granted that it's actually doing a lot for you. Um, but the problem with that is it's designed to be used a certain way. And if you don't want to work that way, you're going to have to somewhat fight the system. And so Unity wants you to build small, isolated scripts that stack to build more complicated behaviors. And that's really cool and modular and lets you do infinite amount of complexity, but it has performance costs. And Unity know this, and that's why they're doing the whole dots thing, because the current architecture for Unity literally rewards you for writing badly performing code. And it's not, it's, not a, it's not a design choice. It is something, something that happens if you lean into a component model because it's designed to be used in discrete chunks of related components. And people like myself and Jason, who've been doing software like this for a long time, know these limitations. And we try to write in a way which kind of steps, sidesteps a lot of the architecture that Unity gives you and works in parallel with it. But the unfortunate truth is a lot of the time you have to hook back in to listen to the lifecycle events that Unity gives you. So, Wherever possible, if you can write your code so it doesn't mention the word mono behavior, and ideally doesn't even have a using statement for Unity Engine, but you can you can do that. It's fine as long as you're not actually implementing mono behavior. Um, you can write really complex code, which does a lot of really interesting stuff, and then you use one mono behavior as a host to the other code. You create something called health, and health can be a class with a bunch of properties and fields and does a load of stuff. But health as a concept doesn't need mono behavior. It doesn't need a start. It doesn't need an awake. It doesn't need update loops. It doesn't need references to rigid bodies. It is just a thing that updates and changes numbers. And so what you do instead is you create something like a health behavior or you use a health on another character's behavior and you can then use it in the Unity life cycle, but you can actually have the item itself live outside of it. So long story short, wherever possible, make your code work in such a way that it doesn't need to rely on Unity components and then you can make a Unity behavior and sit your script inside of it and run it by attaching to the starts and update loops and that kind of stuff. And that gives you the freedom to test it and use it separately and have all of that stuff, but still get the benefits of mono behaviors. So that tends to be how I architect most things. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, I think you're still muted, Jason. Okay, now am I muted? There we go. Ha, I keep muting myself, sorry. All kinds of messed up. Anyway, what, what I was saying before I muted myself, or I guess right when I muted myself, was that um, I, I do the same thing, but generally on the uh, bigger objects like players or enemies or an inventory system or um, something where um, where the object is a bit more complex. I still have plenty of, of just little mono behaviors that don't do that, that don't follow that pattern necessarily for like UI specific elements. Um, I guess the, my point was that I don't like have a default template where I go in and just instantly go to a humble object for everything, mm -hmm. but um, I do it for anything that I think may have any kind of performance characteristics that I care about or is going to grow and yeah. get big, right? Um, well, it comes back to the, um, the talk about what the architecture of Unity is, right? Unity being a component model means if something is a component, you don't need to build an architecture around it. So for example, if you're doing something that's a small script or it's detecting um, trigger enters in a scene and then firing some events or... Um, it's doing some kind of a countdown and then spawning some object. There's no need to spin off an entire, you know, three class deep hierarchy of various different things because they are literally designed to be run as scripts. And it sounds derogatory to say scripts, but it really comes down to what your intended use is. And in my mind, a script is something that is a small isolated use case 
that isn't really meant to be used outside of this project and is meant to be reusable but lightweight. And those things are fine. I will write tons of scripts that are designed to solve a problem. But if it gets to the point where it's interacting with other systems and performing more complex logic, that would be something that falls into more of a system and a component, kind of larger component scale. And those things usually require a level of architecture behind them. So I think we're pretty much saying the same thing. It's just a yeah. case of how do you clinically draw that line? You know? Yeah, I, I assumed you kind of did the same. I just wanted to clarify for anyone listening, don't think that you're just instantly automatically humble objecting every model behavior that you create, right? Yeah. I can do it when it makes sense, but not always as, because otherwise you can just end up creating a bunch of extra work for yourself, burning it out and not doing it because you're not doing it in a case where you're getting a benefit at all. Um, I, I guess a, a kind of an unofficial rule could be how many collaborators do you have? If it's one script with no, not talking to anybody else or one script only talking to one or two other scripts, you can probably do that effectively in line. But if it's a system that's going to be touching multiple components in your application or, you know, connecting a bunch of different things, you're kind of falling into the territory there where you don't want to have to drag in six referenced objects that talk to each other. That should be some kind of a managed system. Yeah. That makes sense. And the ones I'm thinking of that had just popped into my head are all, they've got one. They're basically one-way communication from other systems, right? And just updating yeah. UI elements. Um, huh. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, let's see. Um, well, actually, it, this is one point I think is worth bringing up as well. Uh, regarding the, uh, the comment here, I always regret going the humble object pattern because then I need to inject a lot of things and make interfaces to communicate between the model behaviors. Well, here's an interesting thing, right? I think a lot of people make this mistake. They kind of feel like they have to go one way or another, completely extreme. And here's, here's something that I, I think might be a good way to look at it, is the point of this architecture is to make your life easier to scale and grow your software. So you may think if I, if I build something so that, the, that I've inverted the dependencies and I have to inject everything in, I have to go full dependency injection and have injection roots and build loads of stuff in, but you don't have to. If you have a humble object, you can just in your awake function instantiate the four collaborators and pass them into the object and then use it as a um, strategy pattern or something to delegate to the other calls. And why that's valuable is because you are you're using the humble object monitor behavior as a way, almost like a facade, to hide all of that complexity from everybody else. But you're giving yourself the freedom to swap out the configuration internally. Now, is it technically a solid principle violation? Sure, because it's not it's not conforming to the open close principle. But we're talking about practical use here. And if I have a if I have a class where I have to either choose between injecting six collaborators or writing it all in line in a script, I'm kind of missing a lot of interesting gray area. And for me, having a script that I can open and change one instantiated new, you know, uh, new Apple uh, high score system to a new Android high score system, it may not be the most decoupled thing in the world, but I've moved it from being, I have to rewrite this entire script to support a new high score to I change one word and I get a new high score system. So, and you're not you know, having to go in and change the high score system and go in and make modifications in one and yeah. not the other and then try to figure out where they belong and have a bunch of if statements and switches and crap. Yeah, so it, it's not about being, you know, high and mighty about this and sort of saying, oh, you must conform to every single principle or you're writing horrible, dirty scripts or whatever. The fact of the matter is you are trying to get a job done and you have to ask yourself where the practical lines are. And if you... Probably the only rule I would say you should always follow is always leave code better than when you found it. So if you open a script and you look at it and it's like, oh, I made some horrible hack here, do something small to fix it. And if you just keep that mentality going, the code will improve as you go. So you're allowed to write code that isn't perfectly ideal for the scenario you want, make it work, and you can start refactoring it to make it better. And as the time goes by and your, your project grows, you might eventually get to the point where you want to use a dependency injection framework. Now, when you do have a dependency injection framework in your larger project, you've already got a class with four collaborator collaborators passed in in the constructor. All you have to do is take them out and inject them. You've already done three quarters of the way there, so the last step is quite an easy one. So being pragmatic is probably a better approach than 
dealing with the, oh, now that it's a humble object, I have to inject six things. Feel free, if the case makes sense, to just treat the awake function as a constructor and just manually find your dependency. Because it's still a better option than writing all of that code in line. Yeah, that's essentially what I like to do. So I like that. Um, if there's not anything super exciting you wanted to jump onto, I, I did kind of want to hit um, some coding standard stuff. Are there is there okay. any other question you want to jump onto before? No, no, we... I think I think that's it. A lot of it is just discussion about what we were saying. Okay, cool. Yeah, we can always jump back in. I mean, I see a lot of stuff going by, but I really want to hit this uh, coding standard stuff because I'm gonna record the video. I'm gonna record whatever take number twenty of the video. Um, hopefully tomorrow, assuming I don't lose my voice. Uh, but anyway, I wanted to go over some of the stuff that um, I was thinking of. I, I went through looking at some old code, coding standards docs and some of the current ones, just trying to think of all of the things that would normally be in a coding standards doc. And um, mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about like why it matters and all that too, but um, I really just kind of wanted to go over what I've been using and the stuff that I found and see if anybody has other stuff that... I missed or, um, and also just make sure that everybody kind of gets an idea and kind of a preview of what some coding standards look like. I want to switch to desktop mode though. So I might get muted for just a second. Um, I'm going to hit the button cool. and we'll see if everything just kind of. I might goes. realign here so I can get a better look at the screen if you're demonstrating stuff. Yeah, I, I assume people can still hear me. Okay, that might be better if I add an input capture instead of an output. All right, so um, I, oh, here, I'm going to share the doc for everybody in YouTube too. So you guys can jump on, um, comment, whatever, if, if you have ideas thoughts um just let me know and then also if anybody has ideas on formatting it to make it look nice and beautiful and pretty just uh let me know i'd, I'd love to hear it and now i just have to find the correct um chrome window so i can drop this into chat apparently um, I got... apparently I, I might be a bit echoey in this scene i'm not sure if that's still the case oh no well hopefully you're not now if you are i don't know let me know, everybody, if the audio is still okay. There's still a little bit of teething. Oh, okay, there. The I found it. Working. It's because I had added you as an output. Okay. My fault. Okay. All better. Okay, ho hopefully that should be good now. Good stuff. Okay, cool. So we got lots of people in the dock already, too. It's like nice. people are starting to hop in. So um, th like, this is uh, not an actual dock. It's somewhat of a dock. It's like the start of the dock and um, an outline for the things I wanted to talk about in the video and the things that I wanted to put into the doc. And the plan was to just put together a easy to use coding standard doc that people can just use if they don't have one or they're trying to figure out how to come up with their own. Um, and then just throw it into like a PDF or a Google doc or something that's just publicly available so people can jump in, use it as a template um, or steal whatever they want from it, right? Anyway, yeah, can you see it now, Jason? I can, yeah. Okay, cool. So yeah, I just kind of wanted to go over the things that I have in it, um, talk really briefly about the actual standards that I use, and then um, see if anybody's got ideas for other things that I might have missed, like other edge case scenarios, like some things that I almost didn't think about constants, right? Just because like, it's rare that I use constants, right? I do use them, but you know, it's still rare. So like just thinking um, all, all the things through. So the the first section was just talking about naming. So I was going to dive into um, just a, a little bit about why naming matters and keeping it not on having good naming, but just on consistent naming and making sure that everybody agrees on how things are going to be named. If you're going to abbreviate, what abbreviations you're going to use and when you're going to use them, um, which should be either all or none, I think, for if you're abbreviating an word like going to abbreviate amount just make it always amt but uh, in general my recommendation for naming stuff is to pretty much never abbreviate stuff um unless yeah, the, there's the a very time, very good reason what's the that only time i ever kind of give a hand wave to abbreviation is when you're talking about domain specific language 
So it doesn't apply yes. in games as much. But if you're working in a system like a banking system, uh, I would highly recommend this. And it may be difficult at first because I've had this problem myself. Um, if you're working with a system where it's to deal with technologies that you're not familiar with. So again, banking is one. If you're working with an accounting style system, there's a lot of keywords that mean different things to an accountant yes. than the way you would use them in normal language. And it's worth learning what these are and using them the way your clients will use them. Because what's going to happen is they're going to talk to you in a particular language. And so using the right glossary of terms can often help. And sometimes there's common abbreviations for the kinds of things that a company uses. Um, but that's so, only for very specific things, like very specific, specific cases, terms yeah, like that are specific to that industry. Um, yeah. Don't do it for like weapon because like, yeah, yeah, don't, don't, like, don't it, like it, 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 these would words, be like yeah. abbreviations like that the healthcare industry would use or like a IBAN, the international bank account number, right? It'd be a very yeah. common or at least somewhat common, well-known international terms, right? Or, or at least domain specific terms. Uh, but other yeah, than like that, for example, I, I was working uh, with a banking institution and one of the things I was doing was to deal with uh, accounts for um, Americans using a, uh, a f account for other countries in an American banking system. And so I had to deal with something called FFIs or foreign financial institutions. And in that case, FFI is a lot easier to use throughout your code than foreign financial institutions every time. And it is a single unified term. Everybody knows during the entire, anyone who's working on the application knows what an FFI is. And so that is about the only kind of scenario that makes sense for people. And yeah, and essentially these are just the the very rare edge cases. But in general, just try not to abbreviate it all, right? At least that's what yeah. I think that's what we agreed on. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Um but I mean the bigger part and the most important part is spelling that out. Whatever abbreviations you're gonna use and if there are domain specific things, um spell those out in the document too. Um it's probably not the first thing to start off with. Um well, maybe it is, but abbreviations might belong somewhere else in, in your doc. Um, I'll try to come up with some in the example doc, too, mm -hmm. to see if, um, if I can come up uh, with any. It's hard to when you think of games. Yeah, because a lot of this stuff, too, like, there's, there is, I, I hate to have, like, the, um, to be the contrarian, but there's always that sort of exception to each rule, right? And, for example, with the abbreviations one, uh, I think we discussed this before, the length of a variable is almost... Uh, proportional to the scope of the of the code you're writing, and so oftentimes, if I'm writing um, something like, uh, let's try to find a good example. Yeah, like weapon is a great one, right? If we're using weapon as a as a system, and we talked before about why we might use var, well, if you're writing the phrase weapon weapon equals new weapon, and then weapon dot blah 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 blah, you keep going down like this. I would, depending on how short lived that variable is, if that if that function is about five lines of code. I might write R W equals new weapon W dot set strength n. And if it's if I'm never using that W again outside of that, it's visibly on screen. I am just putting out the word weapon, replacing it in that context. If those two lines sit side by side, R W equals new weapon W dot set health, whatever. I don't know if I would always do that, but I would say I would allow myself to do that if the, if the code is getting complicated enough that I want to avoid duplicate words. Because it comes down to what value that's adding. And to me, writing weapon, weapon, equals new weapon, weapon, dot, set, right, whatever, there's a lot of redundancy in that line. And you're not adding more information. So that's one other case I might abbreviate if the scope is short enough that I can visibly see on screen that I'm repeating the same words and I want to cut one of them out. Yeah, it's funny because the, um, the only scenario that I can think of where I do that is like the exact opposite where... It's and it's not really the exact opposite. So it'd be like I'm, I see the weapon, and then every line after that for the next fifteen lines is setting a property on it. In that case, I might shorten it down to a W, only so that it's a little bit easier to read because of the clutter. Um, True. Well, in, in that case, what I tend to do is I would be like set weapon properties. I would pass in the yeah. weapon, and then inside of that function, it would be weapon W, and then W dot for each property. And I think that would the be the thing. ideal way to go. Um, yeah. but in the shorter case, uh, but I can just think of a couple of scenarios like, um, looping through and manually deserializing, um, network data, 
sometimes in that case i'll shorten those and it's essentially it's also in a loop but i mean it's a method called from in a loop but it still kind of shortens them down but um and and the biggest reason by the way for anybody that's watching and thinks this is a stupid thing to even care about um it's a if your variable names aren't obvious like if you do have that weapon w um equals new weapon and somebody tries to use it down below and it's not in on it the lost screen. That line where it references weapon W, and all they know is there is a W in the middle of the code, and they have no concept of what it is or where it came yeah. from. Yeah, exactly. They they just don't know what it is. And the worst case is for um, actual fields and members. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Let's go on to some of the other things in this list because there's a big, long list of stuff on yeah, here. Yeah, we, we basically all, we could literally go on for another half an hour about just that one line abbreviations. Yeah, yeah just about names and abbreviations. Yeah. But um. The first rule, and I think this is a pretty good rule in general for most things, is to have a one or prefer at least one class or struct per file so that you have a single class per file um, and they're nicely split up. And the, the biggest thing for me on that is that when I see a change list with commits to a file and to a class, I assume that the code is related to that specific class and not some other class or struct that happens to be in that file named for the class. So if I see something changed on character, I don't expect it to be like, you know, character item location got a new enum value or whatever it is, because it shouldn't all be in that that file. They should all have their own file so I can tell exactly what's changing. Um, And so that we don't have to change the same file to modify a different class, right? So we don't have those merge conflicts um, and confusion. And yeah. do do you kind of follow the same rule? I, there are some cases where I'll have subclasses or multiple classes per file, yeah, but they they're, almost they're definitely always very rare and contextual. Like I'd say, the only time I definitely break this rule would be like in most cases I follow the same thing. Although on the whole, uh, on the whole internal classes, I ha- I hate doing internal classes simply because it adds the noise of thing dot other thing every single time. So I would often put those. Um, you know, in parallel rather than nesting one to the other. But one thing that I will do this on is if I have a number of classes where they only serve as implementations of something else. So we're, we're not really going to go into generics here because that's a whole different conversation. But if I had something like a generic repository, I might have five repositories in one file that all implement the generic one and apply that one object that it's binding to. Or uh, probably a more accurate example of something else, like even though you shouldn't use exceptions in games in general, um, I might have something called file exceptions, and I will put each exception all in one file because they're basically fundamentally the same one line of code with maybe at maximum one property differential. And even then, they probably don't. So if I have like five or six related exceptions, I don't want a folder that contains 50 exception files that are all one line of code. I would rather have one file called exceptions about X, exceptions about Y, and I will basically add the new one and change the one line that's different. Um, but both examples I just gave do not apply to video games. So I don't do it in video games. So, yeah. Yeah, the only yeah. case I thought of was uh, with your generics example. It may, ha- may have a base class and then an abstract um, generic class on top of that. Um, and then the implementations might be in other files, but it might still have those two in there. They have the yeah. same name, so they kind of fit in the same class. And, and they're never being used independently i guess or sometimes i've done something like i'll have a command interface and then i might have a generic command which is the same thing but takes in a type of t actor or t entity and i'll put both of them together because they're both technically the command interface but these are all really obscure and probably irrelevant examples so yeah. let's just stick stick with the in general one, one file per class yeah <laughs> just all right let's that. jump into um Oh, we already talked about abbreviations. We went on about that for a while because they are generally terrible and they're terrible because yep. you forget what they are or other people don't know what they are or you just assume people know what they are and people read the code and they misunderstand what it is and then they do the completely wrong thing and waste three hours breaking all your code because your abbreviation was not clear and nobody knew and what the hell probably one of the meant. simplest things about abbreviations people don't realize is if you're abbreviating, you're taking potentially three separate words and using them to three letters instead, you're assuming when somebody sees those three letters, they'll think the same three words you did. Yep. And that's very often not the case. Like if you've got something called, you know, minimum distance to check, and you might call it MDC or something, who is going to think they're the three words you chose? Like it's often, you may think it sounds obvious because you're literally sitting there in the problem domain. 
but oftentimes it's really a bad idea, not just because it's confusing and short, but people might not even come to the same conclusion about what three letters they would have chosen to explain that item. So oftentimes coming up with a name that's sort of a little bit longer is, is often going to make everyone's life easier. One that doesn't require any mental thought. Right? The goal is to be able to read the code and not have to think about it. Just understand it by reading it. Um, all right, let's skip abbreviations because I know we'll talk about it forever. Yeah, we, we could basically go on forever. But I would, I would I just say them. as a cap on that, it goes in both directions, right? This comes down to don't make your methods too long and don't make them too short. And the same thing I said about using weapon as a redundant term. The point of almost all of these rules, which may seem very pedantic and, and particular about particular details, because you may think, oh, I'm just writing this one line of code. It doesn't really matter. But you're forgetting in six months' time, that's one line of code in 50,000 lines of code that people have forgotten about. And so you want to make sure that that's as readable and as understandable at a glance as humanly possible. And this comes down to trying to make every single line make sense in the context you're in. And if I have to scroll up to the top of the file to figure out what the short name of whatever it is you're using is, you failed at making me read and understand that line. And if you've written everything and you've appended the word controller to every single variable, it's the same problem. You've now made it hard for me to read because my eyes are unfocusing and just seeing controller or index everywhere. You've, you've appended index to the end of every single thing. Um, so it, it comes down to either way, try to write code so it, it gives across as much information as possible without being noisy and in the way. And that's pretty much both sides of the whole abbreviation argument. Yeah, I think that kind of wraps it up good. Yeah, don't abbreviate. Don't do it. It's bad. <laughs> All right, casing, classes. Um, I assume everybody does this in here. Um, if you Please don't, because do, I, I drive it's me okay. insane every change. time I see a lowercase class. Yes, classes should always be Pascal case with capital first letter and capital letter for anything after this. So if it was like a weapon... Ammo or a weapon entities, uh, right? scope. In, in, What's in that? every case, they're new entities that are being newed up. They're, they're, they're items. They're like a person's name. They're meant to have a pronounced, you know, uppercase. This is an entity. Yes. And instances of it would potentially be lowercase, but the actual class itself is always the capital, you know, the templated yep. version. Yeah, so it's on that class definition. Always capital. Uh, methods. Same thing. It's funny. They're actually exactly the same as classes. Uh, Pascal case and uppercase. Um, and then I had sections down here on whether they should be nouns, verbs, and all that stuff. Um, I feel, I, I wonder if I should maybe mix them up though. Like when actually, like should casing be its own section or should it be um, like broken down by classes um, versus methods and the casing and rules around each one of those? thinking about when think laying out this actual time. doc. I think you were right when you said we should probably do an example because a lot of this is going to be hard to explain in isolated cases. I think it might just be better at some point to write a bunch of little scripts that say... That's what I actually this. have. That's oh, funny. Okay. So I actually built a... Yeah, to do a video, I have um, example scripts of, of all of these to go through. <laughs> so, But I need to get them into, a, into a, an actual doc that people can read to. Uh, I'll just go on to the next one and then... Um, We'll talk about that after. Just kind of dive through them real quick. Uh, method parameters, so stuff that gets passed into a method, are generally uh, camel case. So they're yep. usually nouns, I guess. I could talk about that a little bit. And they start with lowercase and then uppercase each word after that. Um, properties, all uppercased, and they're usually public. Occasionally have private ones. There's a little bit down below about that. And then private fields our Pascal case, and I am back to using an underscore in front of him. Good. It's funny because... You joined the right side. <laughs> yeah, there's a question on the... Let's see. Let me see. Bam. So what about serialized fields? Because Ryder suggests not to use the underscore for serialized fields. Um, I disagree I with Ryder. If, if I, I still if I, use if it's it private for private serialized field, I will still use the underscore. Yeah, I'm still the same way. And part of it is just that... Um, I think in Rider it's a little bit easier to tell because it gives. I forget what the indicator is, but some people I work with still don't use Rider. So if they're not using it, or people watching videos and using a different editor, um, I feel that the, the underscore there still helps. So that's the main reason that I still use it. Um, 
for everybody that doesn't get the other benefits there. Um, and then, okay, yeah. So underscores, yeah. I use them for all private fields. And the main I, reason, I do think again, it, it is It may just, have been said as a joke, but it's worth pointing out. An alternative version to the underscore is, in fact, using the this dot. You can reference class scope by yes, saying yeah. this dot ammo equals ammo. And that's implying that this is the class scoped version relative to the one that's currently in scope of what you're doing. You can. That's actually perfectly fine. It, but if that doesn't that, help with the um, the problem of, um, or the, the main goal that I want to solve with it, which is just having people be able to see a parameter or a, a private field and instantly know that it's a private field and not a method parameter. Like that's yeah, my main that's, goal is to have them be able to tell the difference without having to think about it at all. Well, for me, the main thing is, is that if you don't, if you follow the this dot convention, you have to remember to put the this dot. And if you don't, you will end up assigning a value to itself and you can get stack overflow exceptions. So quite frankly, that risk alone is a good reason not to. And I find that using the underscore, it's very declarative. Underscore ammo will always and forever be the ammo that is contextually at the class scope of this object. Yeah. But this dot ammo could be used as in the constructor. But if you forget that this dot, it, that, that one little addition is going to confuse you. And th this gets even more difficult if you start using um, base classes and you start having a chain of uh, base objects that are extended from. This starts to take on a very different context because you now have to deal with this and base as two different elements. And if you override a function that might have a this or a base in it, say for example, a property, you're getting into some crazy territory. But underscore will always and forever be privately scoped. Because if you have a property, if you have a protected underscore, you're doing it wrong. Protected shouldn't be, in my opinion, in terms of how you're doing it. So it comes down to how do you approach the scope of that object? Yeah, well, how do you do your protected fields? I'm curious now. Uh, for me, I treat it like it's a property. So I would use the same name convention I would use as you would for properties there. I would you would just make a property. protected property generally. Okay. Yeah. And that's, so I that think I usually what I end up doing is I make protected public, or sorry, protected properties. Um, and very rarely do I have something that's a field that's protected. Um, I'll be honest. The only reason I really do the protected properties for protected fields is because uh, having something dot underscore something yeah. It's just horrible to me. And if you have base dot underscore whatever, it just looks very horrible. And it very clearly implies something is being exposed that shouldn't be. Yeah. So having base dot ammo remaining is easier than, you know, base dot underscore ammo. You know what I mean? No, I think that makes sense. Okay, let's go on to uh, constants. So for constants, I always uppercase and underscore. I've seen people uppercase without underscores, but I find it a lot harder to read. Um, and I've seen people just do lowercase, um, spell it out with underscores without, um, all kinds of different stuff. What do you generally use? Do you have a preference? What does um, everybody else in chat use, by the way, for constants? You guys use uppercase like this or do you I'm use something else? I'm just kind of curious time. to get an idea of every what everyone else time. is same using. Same as you. Yeah. What's that? I, I'm the same as you, screaming caps. Because I, I find that there is a very clear distinction that something is a constant and again, maybe it's just because I approach it from the way the compiler does. If something is a constant, it will literally be replaced in code. If you were to decompile that code, you won't see a variable reference. You will see the literal value. And so in my mind, I like the idea that I'm giving this giant name for my benefit, knowing that anything that's screaming caps will be fundamentally replaced by that value by the time it gets to uh, the compiler. So that's like a mental thing for me. Yeah, for me, they stand out as like there's some weird magic number in here and making it big and bold like that means that I can be aware that there's a big magic number in here or magic string. It's usually a number though, right? And then I'm just it kind of like draws my attention to it, I guess. I find that Pascal case, because it looks exactly like an accessor, you will get into this weird territory where you might ask yourself, is there risk of side effect? from this public accessible field and does it potentially uh, run other things or even worse, does this value potentially change at runtime? If it's yeah. screaming caps, it looks very different than a property. Fundamentally say, I know with absolute certainty for the rest of my code, this will be the number it is at the time I check it and it will compile to that value in code. And I find 
I, I say this all the time. I use these conventions to give information and try not to uh, kind of overdo it. And I think having all of that extra information, this will compile a different way. This is going to stay the same for the lifetime of this application. This is a lot of information I get just from changing the way I format. Yeah, I could see a scenario too, where if you use the Pascal case on your constants and then for some reason something changed and it became no longer a constant, um, <laughs> Yeah, you might not even realize you know, that that it had uh, changed and it, without I, the naming changing. I, if the naming I've literally matches. done that, where I've changed a constant to a calculated field, and then it ended up getting into weird territory because I'm performing some calculation like dividing one value by another and not really understanding the side effects that has. I think having that naming makes you think like, okay, if I'm changing this, I need to really I need change to do a it. Literal refactor, rename, and fundamentally rewrite the way it's working. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then for placement of constants, I like to put them in the file where they're used, assuming that there's one file that they're used in, which is often the case. Yeah. Uh, uh, I would say they are almost always first and foremost top of my files. Because they represent the, if it comes down to the point of information of what you're seeing, screaming, screaming cap constants say, these will always stay the same, commit them to memory, and then go about your day at the rest of the code. And they give me a really quick look that I can glance at and say, what are the constants for this application? And even if I don't remember the values, like for example, I've done stuff where you've used uh, the gravity constant or whatever. If you have gravity in all caps, you don't need to remember 9.8, blah, blah, blah. You just say gravity, I get it. And you go down the rest of your code knowing what it is. And if you ever need to scroll all the way up to the top to read it, it's there and you don't have to look at it. It's just something you memorize. So constants always for me, very top of the file, first thing you see, but also the first thing I skip over <laughs> once I once I understand what they are. Yeah, yeah, I, I like having them like that too, just right up there. Um, and they shouldn't be changed. The, so one thing I used to do back in the day was use constants as settings, and I would go in and change those. I no longer do that um, because I've learned that it's a, a good way to make a mess because it's hard to know which ones are adjustable, what valid ranges are. Um, why you're changing them. I, I found that it's a lot better now to just make them customizable, usually through the inspector or some. I, I, these tool. days I use triple object. I will make yeah. a setting file and I will set default values. And that way I can have uh, development ones versus um, production ones. Yeah. And I'm the same way. Um, so I should actually put this, um, just briefly mention that in there because I, I feel like it's easy to use constants as settings because there's zero setup work. Um, and sometimes I'll use them as a quick setting like while I'm in development. But before I commit, I'll try to get it over to um, an actual configurable system, something yeah. where, where designers can modify it. So um, let's dive on to classes and uh, coding standards for classes. So the, the first part, and I think you briefly touched on this, was that they should be nouns. The names of classes should be yeah. nouns. So it should be Pascal case where they got the uppercase on each word, but then they should also be a thing, like a controller, yeah. a system, a weapon, an enemy, uh, an actor, a car, um, a projectile, a bullet, whatever, an audio source. They should always be a thing, not um, not an action. So oh, I, I don't know if it helps everybody else. And to be honest, there are, there is a weird scenario where I can think of where I have some that are named actions, but go ahead. I was going to say there's, there's something I do mentally for this that really helps, which is I like to consider myself like a director uh, and it's a, it's a play I'm putting on and I'm basically casting the roles and I'm deciding the scene layout. So what I do is I have um, all of the cast as they are the noun objects, right? And they're not just people. I mean everything from a lamp to a bed to a window. And as the director of the scene, it's a stage play. You're like, okay, bed, center frame, window, open dog, walk in. And what you're doing is you're saying noun, perform verb. And that's the way you should think about your code is that all of the entities are the noun objects that are your actors in your play. And then the verbs are the actions you're getting them to do and interact with each other. And if you keep this sort of silly idea of a play that you're controlling, you can start to ask yourself, does the code you write linguistically make sense? Thing, do X, thing, do Y. Thing, give Y. You know what I mean? You can get into this weird territory, but it's like, it's a good way to visually represent things in a way that you can kind of understand to yourself and describe to others. Yeah, I think that's a good, a very good, like analogy there for that. So you just have the 
the objects doing things, which is kind of the uh, the verb part right down here. <laughs> Get into yeah. the methods are all verbs. Um, there is finish up the class part right here. So systems, controllers, managers, that type of naming. I see it in every single project, yeah. and a lot of the time between projects it almost always means something different a lot of the time in a project it means something different um so yeah my notes for that were mostly just that if you're going to use these words make sure that you use them consistently and you define what they mean in your project in your naming standards like that a system does these types of things in this way or controller or manager um and i didn't dive into like exactly how they should do those. Um, I think every team is going to be would, completely different. In a, in a worry to repeat the same hashtag conversation, I would apply almost the same rules to these words as I would to abbreviations, which is do not use them in most cases, except for they make sense in the domain you are in. Now, this is one of those cases where games is quite different. A controller means something in a game that it doesn't necessarily mean in other applications. Well, in this case, controller has context. And this is why it's a valuable word to add sometimes. But if everything has a controller, then nothing's a controller. <laughs> it's just a word that means nothing. So use controller when it's literally controlling something like a character controller. And so a lot of these words, like if you just put system at the end of everything, it doesn't give you any value. It's not going to help you. Sometimes you might need to use a word like manager or system to differentiate from a collection of items and the thing that drives them all in some way. But I would take my time and try to find a better name if possible. If you're using system or manager, at least for me, I consider myself having given up. I'm using that word because I can't think of something better, not because it's the word I should go to. So I think they're usually a sign that something is nebulous or confusing enough that it doesn't quite have a clearly defined job or name. And if that's the case, you're probably using some kind of God object. It might make more sense to think about how those objects interact and maybe there's a better name for it. Yes, that is very, very often the case. The manager one, I think, is the one that I see the most mm -hmm. um, reason for or valid use cases for, which you basically said was essentially just a, a manager of a collection of objects, right? Because you don't yeah. necessarily want to name it your um, cars. You don't want to name it cars, right? You want to yeah. name it something that implies that it, it's doing something with the cars. Um, and it's not just a collection. Um the other was, uh, yeah, it's, it varies from project to project. I, the biggest part, though, if you are going to use them, just make them consistent because people are still going to use them to some degree and just make sure that you've defined, like, if if you are putting any of these words in, that you've defined where they go, what types of cases they, they make sense, at, so that it's obvious to people going in and to, they can understand what's happening there. Um, and then, yeah, casing, Pascal case, and then size. So I, I noted here the ideal, which is that the class fits onto one screen. I keep looking off to the side. That's just because you're off to my side, Jason. Um, so I, I said the ideal is essentially that the class fits on one screen. Obviously not the all the time or even most of the time. But ideally, classes can fit right on a screen. We can read the whole thing and tell everything that it does and understand it just from looking at or at least get a good idea of what it's doing just from looking yeah. at it and not having to scroll. And I like to start considering splitting it up if it passes 200 lines. I mean, I'll, uh, I'll consider it? splitting it before that, but once it hits 200 is when it gets like a serious consideration. Yeah, that, like, that's I an think actual I problem that needs about. solving. Yeah. And also, that goes to, that, what Jason's talking about goes for vertical scrolling. If you're talking about horizontal scrolling, the answer is never. If you have to horizontally scroll your code, don't. You've already done something wrong. Even if it's just putting the pressing return and moving it to the next line, it is always better to avoid forcing someone to horizontally scroll. It's such yes. an abnormal thing to do in code. It should literally never happen. Never, I used to, to hate doing that and not do it. And it was terrible. And I don't know why. I had a really wide screen. So I thought, well, my code should just go yeah, all the way it. to the end. I was yeah, so yeah, wrong. Um, yeah. don't, don't make your code go on to the end. Just before you hit the period, hit enter, and then do the period in the next piece. The line I, of I execution ends at the semicolon, not at the new yeah. line. So you can just extend that on logical piece by logical piece each line, especially if you have a longer 
query that's got like or like a link query where you're doing one thing and another thing and another thing splitting those into lines makes it a lot easier to understand and I, read I used to do exactly the same thing and the reason i stopped was i would have it on an ultra wide monitor going i can read this this is fine but every so often i would bring up some reference material so i would split my screen in two all of a sudden i'm back to a normal sized monitor and all of my code is unreadable because it's half of it's going off the screen and it's like oh okay yeah this is what most people will see Maybe I should reevaluate what I'm doing. This is why everyone so hates me, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Okay. So let's jump into uh, uh, methods real quick. So I assume you kind of, well, I guess first, do you agree on the 200 lines? Is that about? Yeah, that's about right. I mean, I it's anywhere between 150 and 200. Like, yeah. Once you're hitting the point where it's it's hard to encapsulate mentally what it's doing, and that's usually about 200 lines. Like yeah. anything about 100 lines or less, you can pretty much describe almost in a couple of sentences. You're talking to somebody and saying, it does these things. By the yes. time you get to 200 lines, it's probably doing enough stuff that you're having to stitch together some ands and thens. And by the time you get to that stage, the code is doing too many things. So it's worth looking at what you can split it into. Completely agree. I was actually just doing that um, before our call. So I had a, a little script. Um, I wonder if I have it up. I had this... Um, UI ability cooldown one, and it was all the way down to what 163. Um, but you can see right here, it's a uh, line 101 is where I've decided to to split the class into a separate class. So it's actually it was getting down to close to 200. So decided it was time to cut it, split it, make it make it into two. All right, and I think this is one that we actually had talked about. Um, yeah. Before. You were actually wondering if you should. I remember you were asking that yeah. question. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking about it. I, I, it started growing bigger and bigger, and I was like, all right, yep, it was right. Yep. <laughs> I needed to change. Like, so, it, yeah, so at the time when the I questions... asked, I think it was like 80 lines, right? And now it was up to 160. I was like, all right. Yeah, look... yeah you're, you're definitely hitting a, hitting a cap on that. But one, one of the questions was, any tips for decoupling from 200 lines? And oh. I would say, I, I would say that when you're looking at your code, there's a concept called rubber ducky coding. And I find it surprisingly valuable. Basically, the way it works is normally you have like a little rubber duck on your on your table. I unfortunately, don't have one at the moment. I do have a miniature N64 controller for no reason. That's what I tend to look at. But if you have some prop on your desk and you basically talk to it and you say, as if it's asked you, what does this code do? And you describe it. And you describe it and you talk through it and you go, well, it does this and then it does this. And then if this happens, it does this. And if you're wondering how do you split up those 200 lines, Ask yourself where all the ands are. And if you put a load of ands in, you're basically saying two different dependencies or jobs. This thing is, is responsible for two tasks. And if you can think that through, you're like, oh, wait a second. I said this does this and this. What if I had two separate things and I had one of them use the other? And that would make that, it would immediately cut out some of that code. Um, that's one good way to do it. That's exactly what I did is, for this example. It, yeah. That's <laughs> too funny because, think... yeah, I was looking and update active cooldown it would update um it would do this part to update the fill amount and it would update the cooldown text mm -hmm. it was all in here i was like okay and then on cooldown end it would clear the image and it would fade away the indicator thing i was like all right maybe this um oh actually i haven't put in the part where it fades the text indicator yet so it's it was doing two things right there and i was like all right I'll, and i did the exact split that you mentioned so this one actually gets uh, grabbed in awake and then just referenced and called to do all of the work in there. Yeah, and I'm that's a pretty common, a common strategy, right? You, you you figure out a second dependency, you split it out, and then you have one of them use the other. Yeah. Um, that's a good question, though, on how to split it. And I like that, just the listing them off and find, splitting out those ands because that's... Essentially where you're breaking that SRP usually, or a good indicator of where you are. All right, um, you're gonna dive into methods real quick? Yep. So the methods should generally be named as verbs, like taking damage or setting a destination. Um, you should be able to reasonably guess what the method does just from the name without reading it. So just by calling it, the, by reading the caller, you should be able to tell a good idea of what it's doing. You might not understand it completely, but ideally you can tell exactly what it's doing. You know everything that it's doing um, and, and not have you, weird side effects. Go ahead. Yeah, if you're, if you're really like, if you're wondering what's the point of this, it comes back to that example I used before about pretending you're a director and there's actors on stage. 
if I had um, player dot damage, you might stop and go, hang on a second. Am I damaging something else or am I receiving damage? Or if I have player dot destination. Or is that the amount of damage I... that you have? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or am I getting it or am I setting it? There's a lot of kind of confusion. And even if it only takes you a split second to look at the context and go, oh, I'm, I'm receiving a damage number. Okay. That's already like mental cycles you don't need to be doing. But realistically, you want to have whatever action you're performing be done in a in a way that reads like you are giving um, stage command. That's why I can say, player, take damage. You know, chair, set your destination to that corner. Like you're you're giving a command which is very descriptive, and so your functions should read. And if you're ever confused about whether it it reads well, say it out loud. It's perfectly fine to sit there in your office and go, you know, book, open. Oh, I don't need a perform open there because book dot open can be okay. Which is open if it's a whole different thing. But ask yourself, does it read as if it was giving a command? And if that's the case, you're probably fine. Yep. And then on to the next one, I think we can kind of use some of the same examples, which was that it shouldn't have any side effects. Right. So if you tell that chair to go to a destination, you say set or you set destination on it, it shouldn't change into a red chair and you know, start doing other yeah. different things. Right. It should only side effects are like I literally had this conversation with someone earlier today. I was doing some consulting and somebody had a function called um get response codes and it was setting the valid state of a player or a uh, of a of an account, of a of a person's account. And I was yeah. like, hang on a second, I just called get something and a database entry for a person changed its state that is a very confusing state of affairs so yeah we had a very big conversation about this exact topic because what i pointed out was if you run a piece of code called get health and all of a sudden the player changes color because the you, you check the health you check if it's greater than a certain value and you change the color relative to the health value you might go hang on a second something weird just happened you will call get health again and try to check what happens. But it might do the same thing again because by definition, it's a side effect, right? You're doing something that wasn't expected. And so oftentimes, if you want to test something work, you'll call it multiple times. And if it's got side effects, you could have some nasty side effects happening. And I've seen this happen where people do something as innocuous as writing logs. You call a get function and it fires off a log, some kind of message. And they decided that message gets written to a text file. You don't think about it, but all of a sudden you've got a giant text file building up and eating system memory because you're calling get function. That can be very, very confusing and can crash servers. So be very careful that when you call a get function, it is only getting something. It is not performing random alterations to the system. Yep. I've seen the same where they were doing database calls on things that you would not expect there's zero indication by the method call that you would be doing a database call and updating stuff. It happens all the time, but you got to be really careful yeah. about this stuff. Um, so parameter count. I put yeah. on here that the ideal number is zero. Um, it's usually yeah. one or two that we have, but the ideal number of parameters is and often... I actually, I'm probably more um, particular about the zero ideally than most people. If I've got a collaborator between two different scripts, I will often actively not return the value that the second script wants because I already know it's available as a get property on the script. And I will force the other object to call get on it because it's not my job to pass in another version of the state. Now that may be overkill, depends on the context you're going for, but I really like the explicitness of it because it means that I can call that action anywhere without having to go and grab a reference from somewhere the context I'm in, if it's in a command type scenario, I may want to call that almost statically or in some condition where I don't want to have to go, what was that variable over here that I was setting and pass it in? I want to say, go do thing. And then the object itself knows how to query for the piece of data. It so if it's only one property and it's like a flag or something, I won't even pass it into the function. So yeah. I oh, really okay. go for ideally zero parameters for possible. Yeah, and zero is definitely a good idea. And usually in that case, you've got some object or something that has all of the the related state that's getting changed or used in there. And like I said, it's usually, I'd say most methods, I should probably do some analytics, but I'd say most probably have one or two classes. I mean, sorry, one or two parameters um, for, for the 
the actual methods. And then I usually I'd say when you get to more than three, it's time to start splitting things out. Like you probably should be building up a new class, a new struct, or considering making some changes in um, in how you're binding these things together. A lot of the time, though, the simplest fix is to just make like a struct for the data because a lot of time people end up just creating a bunch of data and slapping it into a class um, and then it becomes all of these properties and it could just yeah. be a data structure like this um, little stat data example that I got there like it's, it's still not perfect it's a huge step up from having or you know, passing in every single stat if you're sending some stat data or something like that right yeah uh, and having we should, oh, we should go into a huge big thing here where um, Bob Martin has a really large rant he's done on his blog he talks about the difference between DTOs and entities and that even Microsoft themselves mess, mess up the difference because they often treat DTOs and they'll name them entities. So it comes down to DTO is designed for literally um, for passing information between one system to another. It's crossing a boundary line by passing information. In this case, I have these three properties over here. They need to be over here. I will make a data transfer object that literally transfers data. Yep. If I want that data to be um, datable and have properties on it which change its state, you've moved from a DTO to an entity. And if it's an entity, it is now a first-class citizen in your application. It is something that fundamentally can be changed and has a lot of other things involved. For example, a player is some kind of an actor who might have do a load of things, move and change color and equip weapons and whatever while a DTO is purely, I have data here, it needs to be over here, and I don't want to pass in a 10 comet limited list of parameters. So drawing a very good line between those two is a good idea to make your life easier. If you are making a DTO, make it a struct, and not put mutatable methods on it. Treat it purely as the job of moving fields from one location to another, and let the actual methods and the services do that for you. If it's an entity which has to conform and change its own data, kind of lift it up to more first class and then give it more validation logic and make it an actual big item. But if it's only a few fields, shouldn't have that logic. That should be handled by a service of some kind. Yeah. yeah. This is a, a good... Um, uh, uh, I, I'm trying to just think, thinking and talking at the same time. <laughs> I'm having a hard time today. Um I think that's a pretty good explanation of it. Um, and I think that my example here um, should probably dive into some collections and other things for maybe some be some good examples of how to refactor when you start to have too many parameters. Um, I just keep thinking of the time, like I remember back when I was working at Sony and one of the tools that I wrote had the worst method ever. It had like, I don't know, 24 parameters or something insane. Oh. This is a long, long time ago. <laughs> I did not realize, I, although, I, to be honest, this, this is, I think, the one that kind of, like, made me learn, like, okay, this actually is bad. I kept adding more and more optional parameters. I was like, that's fine. I just add another optional parameter, add another optional parameter, add another optional parameter. And then eventually things started getting hard. Things started breaking. You know, and it got really, really hard when it got to, like, 20 I'm like, okay, like, ah, uh, uh, shit, like, the calls to it suddenly were near impossible. Uh, figuring out what was going on, it got extremely complicated and needed a lot of work. Um, yeah, it turned into a big mess. It was kind of the, the time when I learned that uh, big giant methods, or at least not, not so much big giant methods, but lots of parameters into, I guess I'd still call it a big giant method now. Um, mm. or are bad because that thing was relatively well well let's let's sort of deconstruct that a little bit and be more kind of clinical uh because lewis asked effectively why isn't it unnecessary to basically have an object whose sole purpose is to send data from one side to another well let me be really more specific about this when you have a method that takes in some parameters you might be thinking of as oh i just wrote this method what you're actually doing is you are saying i have this public facing contract of Give me this information and this thing happens. So that seems very kind of like, oh, that's just what you're doing. You're writing a script, it's got a contract. You're forgetting that you have basically publicly exposed your entire application. If you give me these two things, I will do this task. And your, your application might be, okay, cool. I will now write 500 places in my entire code base 
do this thing, here's your two information, thumbs up, everything's happy. If you decide later to add a third thing to that, you've just invalidated hundreds and hundreds of lines of code that have a different contract than they were promised at the time they wrote that code. So if we're talking practically, why would you write a DTO? Well, because a boundary line is prone to changing. Two parts of your application between your persistence layer and your, uh, your controller or your controller and UI, these are areas that are very prone to change. You might add more properties to the, like you might add a, um, if you're doing like a, lo a loading screen, you might decide to add a bunch of uh, tool tips that show up. That boundary line will change. You are now adding more information to be displayed that wasn't there when it was originally just a loading screen. So if you had a method call that took in values and you're now adding a list of messages to display, you are changing that contract for anybody who listens to that contract. If you instead use a DTO, you are basically passing in data to display on loading screen. And you can change or add to that list without breaking the contract. The contract still states, we take in a data to display on loading screen. And other objects may know about the extra data and add more to it, but you're not breaking the contract that every other script uses. If you are extending the parameter count, it's not just ugly, it's not just the fact that it adds loads more things, it's that you are now invalidating the promise you made to every other function call in your code which calls that. And you will have to go back and change it retroactively everywhere else. So, if something is prone to changing, is likely to have more than two or three parameters, you make a DTO and pass that in so that you've safeguarded against the most likely outcome of probably adding more fees. So that's basically the reason. And you're usually going to do that for anything that's going to grow throughout the project, right? Um, parameters start to grow and grow. Like if you, in my really light example here, you could start off with just strength as your only stat in your game, right? And then in that case, passing it in it totally makes sense. Um, and maybe even you add intelligence, but if you start to add a third stat to your game, it's when it's time to start thinking about making these DTOs and splitting stuff up. Mm -hmm. And then weird later on, you decide, column. hang on a second, I want to like send previous value and the new value and show like a difference. All of a sudden you're doubling each stat, but what if it was just stat data, which you could do all of that without changing your contract? Yes. In that case, I wouldn't necessarily send that. I would send like a stat changed event with a stat ID and a stat yeah, value, exactly right? Same, yeah. In fact, even in this case, that stat data object would probably be internally um, either an array or a dictionary of enum to value lookups or something mm -hmm. more complex if I have some more advanced stat system. But like at the very base level, it'd be like a dictionary or an array that's um, indexed by the enum value I, of the, the stat. Yeah, for me, it would probably be an... Uh... It would be an object which contains a name, a previous, and next, and it would be distributed in an event as event arg. So yes. Well, I meant the the, the the stat data. If you were going to send all stats, sorry, the oh, the, yeah, the, yeah. the stat data holding it would be that, and then yeah, you'd make like an event um, that holds the previous value, the current value, and then the stat ID for when it changed, yeah. or um, an array of those for multiple stats changed. Assume if you're batching up these stat change sense, right? So a lot of the time, like thinking in like an MMO context or just a multiplayer game, um, you equip an item, you might be modifying like five stats. So we want to send all of those stats in one event. So we'd send like an array of the previous values, array of old values, an array of uh, the IDs or an array of structs mm -hmm. with that data in it. Um, just so that we don't send multiple. Um, all right, should we jump onto properties real quick? Yeah, let's go first. So properties are generally nouns. These are like things that are on your class, on your object, like subparts of your noun object class, right? Uh, they're Pascal case, just like classes. And they. this is one where I find that people struggle, fight against, or just don't do. Um, and it took me a little while too was making the type name and the variable name yeah, match. It feels off, but it's perfectly fine, and I prefer to do it that way myself in certain cases. Yes. It feels weird. It feels like you need another word before the word weapon, the second weapon here, um, but you don't. And when you leave it off and you get used to leaving it off and just, just spelling it or naming <laughs> your classes to yeah. match exactly like that, eventually it starts to become second nature. And it feels a lot and, and easier. please to don't arbitrarily put my or this i've seen yes. this weapon or my weapon or whatever it's or the weapon or yeah equipped <laughs> yeah, weapon yeah. right 
Yeah, it's like, nope, well, it's the only weapon he's got. Like, just call it weapon. Like, he doesn't have <laughs> multiple weapons to differentiate. Just call it the one thing that it is. And that's usually the case. So when, when we do that naming, it's because there's one of that property on there. If there were multiple weapons on there, we For wouldn't example, do that. We would have, like, next, a primary and a secondary. Have, or, yeah. Yeah, like, another one is if you've got a previous weapon and a current weapon, yeah. I would have current weapon and previous weapon. Yeah. I would make a point of being descriptive if there are literally two weapons which could be construed one to the other. Right. Although if there's only one, because otherwise, if you do this and there are two, it's hard to know that there are two, right? It's easy to miss that there are two. You type in weapon and weapon shows up. You don't even think about the other things that are there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Oh, and it does not apply when using an interface. So this is kind of important. Sometimes Uh, it does, but not to the point of um, putting the I in front of the object name. Right, so. Although, without getting into too much of a, a higher tangent here, I'm in the camp of I don't always put the I in front of my interface. I've no noticed. Reason. It's okay. I accept you anyway. <laughs> that one I admit is a point of contention. That, that one and the screaming caps are two things that I've submitted code to things and people correct me on. I've been like, nope, that is not a mistake. That is a personal choice. I am standing by both of those. Fair enough. Yeah. I, c- I could see that. I've had people try to correct me on the on the screaming cap. So, yeah. Uh, and what he's talking about there is just not putting the I before the name of the interface. Um, I do it all the time now just because I think when I learned about interfaces, it was Microsoft standard, which I think it still is their recommendation. But I also just found that it made it really easy to tell if something's an interface. Well, if it I has a big fat question. I there, there's zero question. I don't have to think about it. For, I don't think like... Is this an abstract class? Yeah. Is this something else? Like, nope, it's an interface. I know. And that's perfectly fine. And I, I 100% agree with that reasoning. And so for me, it comes down to two questions. Does the, does the people consuming this code need to know this is an interface? For example, in a previous thing we talked about, if you were using interfaces to represent behaviors, I am damageable. I can be attacked. I can drink water. <laughs> Whatever the interface is, or even I equipable or whatever like that those kinds of things possibly because they fall into a category of people need to know their interfaces so they can compose them together but if i have something like a raycaster and i have as i've done in my own projects i have a raycaster sphere caster uh line caster and then you've got uh ar casters which are different and all of these different casters i could all implement i caster and then pass an i caster around my code but it's an irrelevant piece of information to somebody if they are using a caster or they are using an I caster. Realistically, if the context there doesn't require the information that it is a behavioral interface type, they think they're using an object called caster. It doesn't matter whether it's an interface or not. The I, to me, muddies the contract. It's irrelevant information to pass around. So I would use raycaster or caster without the I. I would use I'm damageable or I damageable with an I. And so it's hard to explain to people that contrast. But that's that's the personal kind of mentality I use. Does it represent a behavior that will be implemented by other people? Or does it represent a public-facing contract for a feature I have completed and I am exposing as a feature? Hmm. But that's contentious, so don't follow that rule. Yeah. That's just no, that's fair. It's, <laughs> it's a fair argument. Uh, I, I can see it. Um, no. I don't think, uh, and and I think this applies for everything on here too. Like, um, don't think that your coding standards have to all match everybody's. Every place I've ever been to has some variation on what they prefer. It almost always comes down to whoever is the lead at the time or whoever cares the most about coding standards at the time. Sometimes nobody does. Um, And just coming up with them. But the, the most important thing is just to figure out and agree on stuff. I mean, I shouldn't say the most part. It's extremely important. If you don't do that, none of the rest matters. Yeah, and that's 100% what I was going to say. Even despite me just saying I don't use the I in every case, if I'm in someone else's code base, they are, I will use the I in every case. I will follow the convention of the team I am working with, even if it goes against my own personal. And I'll do the same with um, the screaming caps. If they don't have it, then I will, um, I'll do that. 100%. All right. So uh, by default, properties do not do not have a setter. So I'd say prefer, or at least prefer not having a setter. Most yeah. of the time, 
there's no setter um, and the thing is either set through a constructor um, if it's not a mono behavior so a lot of time we'll set the property through a constructor or it'll be a calculated one like these private properties for calculations um, or it will have a private setter and get data set in awake or in like start or something else it'll be getting set by something it's very rare to have um a property with a getter and a setter unless it's on a dto so it's mm -hmm. like some which is just like an object where we're expecting something to be setting the the data and changing it constantly and for some reason it's a it's a property on a class and not a, a struct or something um and even then that's one that bothers me but i do it anyway because everybody else does is I won't use public fields because it feels wrong to do so. Yeah. And so in a in a DTO, I will use public properties because that's what everybody, including Microsoft themselves, do. But it bothers me because at some level, I'm pretty sure in a lot of cases that gets compiled down to an accessor and mutator function. Now I know a smart compiler will actually strip it and turn it into a field if it has no overriding implementation. But I don't like the fact that I am effectively writing two methods or a field when realistically I just need a field in a DTO. So that one, I'm annoyed at myself for doing it, but I will conform to convention. Yeah, I just don't worry. I guess the performance characteristics haven't been an issue. So I, 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 I can see the, the compiler, but, you know. yeah, I, I could see it though. But yeah, I mean, generally just to keep with conventions, that's essentially what I stick yeah. to too. Um, do you have anything else for properties that you do? Um, Oh, and, and ex expression body properties. This is a new one, and one that I think that a lot of I'm people a big fan. don't understand. I use them for pretty much everything, use. but I, I, I stopped doing it because I noticed it confuses people in tutorials. I will do it almost all of the time, but I find that it, it looks, unless it's a get only accessor property, I tend not to purely because, again, I find people aren't familiar with the syntax. But for my own code, I will always use the, the expression body. Um, oh, okay. That makes sense. And I usually, when I do it, I, I always want to explain it in the video because sometimes people don't understand. So anybody that is watching, this is essentially exactly the same as this. So the little lambda statement that equals greater than right here is the same as the get, all these brackets, the return, and these other brackets here. It's replacing all of those and just shortening it out so that when you call damage, it just returns back this. And you can add an extra logic here, but in this case... A, 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 good, um, a good practical example of this is we talked about MVP earlier, and in an MVP implementation for the presenter, I will frequently create a mutator uh, property which will have a set-only function, but all it does is delegate to the UI element it's using. For example... I might have something called a um, loading screen presenter and it's got a, a message to display while loading and I will expose a text to, or a message property. And what it will do is it'll just defer to text match pro dot text set it equal to uh, whatever that value is. But even though that's how I write it myself, I've noticed people are very confused about this idea of wrapping a object in another object like that. Um, so I've, I've started using set text or set message because it's more verbose. And I don't like it, but it's very clear to people that I'm calling presenter.set message, asking yeah. them the message. So until people get more familiar with it, I'm going to have to begrudgingly switch to a more verbose uh, mutator format. Yeah, that makes sense. I, making it readable is most important. So makes sense. Um, you want to jump to class layout? Oh, we had talked about this. We are going to times. fundamentally disagree on every element of this, I have a feeling. We do. So the the <laughs> standard order that I put my stuff in um, when I'm making classes, I'm going to read it off, and then I'm going to let Jason share his, sure. which is 150% different. Um, <laughs> static stuff goes right up at the top. So anything that's static, I, I didn't mention constants. Constants I put right above those. So go constants. In fact, let's put that up here. Constants, um, static stuff. So then public properties, private properties, uh, private fields, um, and then also. So serialized private fields are up above the public stuff. And then I'll put the actual private fields that are just for backing stuff down below private properties. 
and then public methods and private methods. Yeah, yeah. And that's generally the order that I get. And now, to be honest, though, ideally, most of the time, this section right here is five to ten lines, right? Like, this the entire section should be small. It shouldn't be bigger than that. Sometimes it, it's terribly longer than that, and it's, you know, like, 50 or 100 lines in some monster obscene class. But the goal is that, like, this is five to ten lines for all of this. Um, and then we get into public. And when I say public, it's also, like, um, awake slash constructor before that. And then update, assuming we're in a mono behavior. But, um, yeah, and that's essentially it. And the public methods would also, I guess, just be if there were callbacks. Usually there are callbacks or there are publicly accessible methods. It's rare that there are both on, on an object. Some objects have them, but most of them ideally don't. Right? They have one or the other. And I guess that kind of falls into that humble object. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, why don't you go over and explain your, your preferred method? So the only one in the same place as I use it is constant. <laughs> That's basically it. All right, I'm moving my constants to the end of the file. <laughs> so I put constants now at the end. <laughs> yep. So for me, um, so I, it, it comes down to, I think I've said this before, but my reasoning for ordering things is what do I expect you to be looking for if you open a script that I've written and you've never seen it before? So serialized fields to me are the thing that you will see before you open my script because you'll have seen it in the inspector. Why so put those first? Because they're the first thing you'll expect to see. because That's what you visibly saw in the inspector before opening the script. After that, you're going to mentally ask, what, what is available on this object and what can I do with it? Which are the two public facing things. So in order, I would put some public properties and then the public methods. So just those top three will be, what did I see already? And what are the things that it does? And how do I use them? And pretty much everything else after that um, go down to the bottom. But I do I do it in order of now calling order. Update gets awake gets called, then start, then update, and then the methods are placed in order of when they chain each other to call. Down as far as the private functions at the bottom, and then the private fields are all the way at the bottom because they're helpers that make things work. I don't need them to be visibly displayed. You will read about them when you start opening up the methods to see how they work. So. Fundamentally, the other way around, it, it comes down to, for me, what information do I think you need to care about? And I try to place it in that order. Yeah, no, I think it makes sense. And I think the uh, having everything at the top is just somewhat it's convention. a, yeah, a it's fall like through. Everyone does. Oh, I mean, it comes from having header files, right? Like the, in the old yeah. days, you had C header files and it, it, we kind of had to predefine all that stuff. And I mean, I'm not convinced that it's not worth throwing it all up at the top. Um, but I don't think that it's a, like a hard rule. I think that they, like we've said a bunch of times, the biggest part is that whatever setup you use, that you just stick to it and that you keep everything in the project the same and get everybody to agree on it. And that's kind of a big part on um, coding standards. So I want to talk about the newspaper stuff, but um, also just how do you, Maybe we should talk a little bit about how we get people to agree to coding standards and everybody do the same thing. Be the first person to write the code. Force everyone to follow you. That's usually the structure I go with. It doesn't work very well most of the time, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, it can work depending on who's who's coming in. If Jason's coming in, then it's probably going to work fine. He'll follow your standards. But a lot of the time, people don't even think about them, right? You bring people in. Coding standards aren't a thing they think about. Most of the time, I'd go into a new shop and I'd say, "Hey, like, um, do you have coding standards doc?" And somebody would have to go like figure out where it was, because nobody had it. And they had like two or three rules that everybody kind of remembered, and the rest is just kind of up in the air. Um, and that's not like any specific place. Pretty much everywhere. Um, there so and I, there I were probably I... some. Everybody I think had their own sets of coding standards a lot of the time. Um, but the thing that I've seen that works the best is getting everybody to agree to them um together and that doesn't mean like writing up the coding standards and sending them out and saying hey does everybody agree to these because that's just not gonna it's not gonna get you the value that you want right you might get some buy-in and the ability to call somebody out when they don't follow it but you're probably not going to get as good of um onboarding or participation as you can and i think the best way to do it is get everybody to 
come in, start with a blank doc, right? Of how do we want our code to look? What do we want it to look like? Let's see if we can come to an agreement of what it would be perfect to look like. And then we'll just do that, right? Like you just like everybody, but having everybody build it together. Okay, so like we want our code to look like this with these specific things for this reason. And just literally going through and discussing it piece by piece and then writing it down. Um, I've seen it work relatively well. Um, I'd like to try it again a couple more times, see how well it works. But it seems like a, a much better way than just trying to get the coding standard because i think people will agree um to a to a point but they're not going to pay deep attention to it if they didn't participate in it and they're going to be a lot more likely to um do things differently on the parts where they kind of disagreed yeah. right because people they, are alluding to things like style cop which yes they do in fact force coding styles yes um but oftentimes that'll just annoy people right their code is being rewritten on them and it's not really a friendly way to approach it so I'll be honest, as someone who has taken on the role of project manager in a lot of cases, uh, my, my approach is a lot less, um, I don't know, uh, communal as Jason's. Mine is a lot more divide and conquer, and I try to solve the problem to solve my own intentions, which is I've come to the conclusion a lot of people haven't thought about why they do this. They will order their methods and name their, their variables based on whatever language they came from. So for example... If you came from Java, you might be naming your get functions lowercase g for get help because that's where you came from and that's what you're familiar with. That's not to do with standards. You're, you're, you're not consciously applying these standards. You're just doing the thing you've always done. So what I like to do is I like to pick each person on the team and just have a five, 10 minute conversation with them and have this conversation. Ask them why do they choose their standards? What benefit does it give them? Do they think it makes it readable or not? And I will genuinely ask and, and have them think about the problem in a way they might not have actually done before. And usually in doing that, I can make suggestions and convince people. And once I've got enough people on my side, I can then go to everybody's a group and say, we've all talked about it. Anybody else have some opinions? I've talked to all of you about the way I approach the problem. And now let's um, write it down as a style cop guide now that everyone has come to a similar conclusion and then it applies. And it doesn't feel like your code's being rewritten. It feels like we all came to a conclusion, but I will do it in a way that has everybody approach thinking about why they do the things they do. And that comes down to things like the, the, um, the leading eye on interfaces. You don't have to agree with my opinion, but if I get you to think about why it's there, you might come around to my way of thinking in the first place, because I find a lot of people don't really actually examine what value they think that kind of thing adds. So the way I would solve it is talk to everybody, get everyone to work together. Once you all agree, then do an enforced style, because then it no longer feels like my personal identity in my code is being overwritten by an evil machine. It is, we've all conformed to agree to this. Whoops, I forgot to do it. The machine helped me conform to the rules we've all agreed on. And that subtle differentiation can be the difference between an angry team and a team that works together happily. Yeah, I think maybe style cop something I should look into integrating sometime soon. Um, I've, I've used, it, it's, it's great when you use it for something like that. But I've used things like JavaScript linters, and I hate them. I absolutely despise them because they will tell you things are wrong when they're entirely not. Like, they will complain about the, your tabbing or kind of organization of certain fields or variables in a way that fundamentally doesn't matter. And I will mm -hmm. never enforce in style cop things like the ordering of these, like we discussed here. Like, I wouldn't enforce class layout with a style cop because that's just obnoxious and will annoy people. I will only enforce things like general naming conventions and conforming to overall coding standards because you don't you don't want your flow as a developer sitting there typing for six hours to be ruined by getting warnings because you decided you have one field above the other or you're not using the right underscore right it, i kind of i'd like to put the faith in the developers i'm working with to care about the code enough to take the time after they've written it to sort of evaluate whether the code is written well and committed and if we've all agreed in advance, even if they commit something that doesn't conform to the rules, rather than be stringently forcing it, I would rather, like, next time I talk to them, go, oh, by the way, could you pop that around or, you know, this is out of order. And it feels less like uh, it's, it's um, kind of martial law or kind of forced rule. And it feels just more like, can we all just agree to be on the same page? And these kinds of things are a really big deal. And 
start talking about topics like psychological safety. And um, uh, a friend of Jason's, uh, Chris, goes into this in huge, vivid detail. And it's really, really interesting to talk about how people are engaging with the team they're working with. And so you may think this is like passing stuff, just a casual, doesn't matter what you name things. But often this can be the difference between people working comfortably or not. So I would genuinely take some time, if you happen to be in a managerial position, to really make a point of having this discussion with your team, rather than feel like you're being overrated. Yeah, I think um, pairing, too, will help a lot with this stuff, too. So we talk about Chris and um, yeah, just mobbing on some of these things. I think it, it can help get people on the same page with um, just standards in general. I, I've seen that actually happen where just pairing with people and suddenly we kind of come to an agreement on how we're going to do things going forward and uh, make some big improvements. So um, That really can't be understated, right? Like as somebody who's a particularly loud personality who tends to take over a lot of the uh, discussions about standards and practices, I make a very particular point of having that discussion with everybody and trying to find out what their thoughts are and come to a conclusion. And it's it, because you will really be surprised how if somebody feels like their opinions are literally being overridden by the editor or that everybody is just conforming to things that they don't agree with, you will find people will work just worse in general. They'll feel uncomfortable with their job. They will spend less time um, kind of conversing with the team on topics. They'll engage less because they feel like their opinion is worth less. And these small little things can trickle through a team and cause a lot of this. Like you genuinely want everybody feeling like they're working together to build the same thing. And so I really wouldn't underestimate the power of some of this stuff when it comes down to having this discussion with the rest of the people. Yeah. It is super important. Um, yeah. I, I don't have anything to add because I think you said it all there. <laughs> kind of laid it out. Um, should we dive into oh, newspaper way, method ordering? Because uh, that's the one thing we do agree on, right? The uh, essentially call call method order, right? So that each oh, thing yes, is uh, in order, I've right? Like never a newspaper, that before, reads yeah. page after page, column after column. You continue the story, you see the next thing, right? Um, I've never heard that term, but I like it. That's definitely I hundred percent agree. I, didn't I think it, I think I stole it from Bob Martin. <laughs> Probably like everything else. But uh, yeah, essentially just reading it um, page by page, right? So it's like every, everything that you, the caller of a method, the method that it calls will be the next one, right? So ideally what you do is keep the things in line so that if I've got take damage and take damage calls like um, reduce health and it calls um, check to see if I'm dead or whatever, those two methods are then underneath yep. take damage in that order or in the order that they're called in. And if those call things, those are after that in the whatever order they're called in. And obviously you can't always have them in complete order because sometimes there are Actually, there's a conditional colors. that literally goes two paths. Yeah, you're going to be Yeah, stuck. or it branches out. But ideally, um, in most scenarios, you should be able to stay very close to this. Um, if you can't, then it tends to be a sign of um, oversized classes, essentially. Um, well, this is an extension of branching. This is an extension of the topic about class layouts. Um, it comes down to what I think your intention is about reading the code. So if you open a script that I've written, your intention is to figure out how it works. You will open up a public method and say, do some big complicated thing. And the first couple of lines is if some scenario do this thing, else do this thing, your mind is going to go, what is do thing and what's do other thing? And if directly under it was do thing and do other thing, you don't have a lot of traveling to do to figure out the answer to that question. If you had a method that said, if some scenario do thing else do other thing, and there was a bunch of miscellaneous scripts, and then the other was, the other two were down here, you would have to basically jump back and forth through the code base. So it comes down to minimizing the amount of work someone has to do when reading and trying to process the script. That they so in general, newspaper ordering is specifically that concept. You want to read through it linearly so it makes sense to read as things are done. Yeah, and reading it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um. I uh, before we I, I dive in. Sorry, I'm getting distracted. We lots of talking right here. Um. I there was a super chat for Jason Story's GitHub projects, so I wanted to call that out real quick and um, see if you want to share anything. I'm not sure if I do. Unfortunately, I think we've said before 
The problem with being a contractor is most of your code doesn't get to see the light of day. Most of it ends up being used and thrown away, or it's used as part of a project that you're not allowed to talk about under NDA. Um, I'm hoping with the, with the advent of this YouTube channel, I'll start producing more code that people can publicly see. Um, other than that, I do have a GitHub. I mean, there's nothing particularly interesting on it at the moment, but we posted it last time. I'll post it again, I guess. Um, it doesn't represent anything particularly large in terms of projects because I don't tend to have the time to do personal projects. But uh, it might give you a sense of, do I follow my own advice? And I'm hoping the answer is yes. Oh, okay. Do you want to drop that into um, chat? Yeah, I'm just seeing if I can find the damn thing. Okay. So I'm going to take a wild guess and say for whatever reason that won't think. So I'll send it to you as well, Jason, just in case. But like I said, I'm not going to call anything in there particularly amazing. Um, none of it really serves too much of an example. I can, yeah. yeah, most of this stuff is, is internal stuff. It wouldn't be particularly interesting to show a scaled project. Um, All right, did you post the link in there? I did. I also posted it to you. In, in... Oh, okay, your link didn't share, so I will share it again. And I'll share the link for um, the doc that's open real quick. Let me just find the, um, the correct YouTube window. There we go. Pull that one over here. Paste. And then we'll paste this one as well. All right. That's a WPF, so I don't know how valuable that'll be to a lot of people. That's all that's really in there. Yeah, it's basically some helper script. So I guess I'll have to just make make a note of demonstrating a larger project at some point for a, for a YouTube channel. Unfortunately, there's not a lot there to really sink your teeth into. It's hard to find um, examples of big projects. There just aren't a lot out that are, like I said, public where they can actually be shown. Right, Most of the time, it's for a company. It's under some NDA or some contract, and you just can't show it. So it makes it kind of tough. Um, yep. Especially because, as well, a lot of the code I write literally gets given to the client. Yeah. So I tend to basically forgo ownership of it. And so I, I don't think they appreciate having their company name littered through a lot of projects I work on. So I tend not to release it afterwards. And honestly, rewriting an example script I wrote for the sake of a demonstration is not worth the effort. Yeah. It's just not worth like rewriting 500 files just for the sake of proving it as a demo. I think it would be interesting to see what you put together when you start the YouTube channel up and what kind of big videos you do there. Um, I think this sort of command activator controller thing might be a good example. I'm hoping I, if I can, you know, get it, I hope to extend that to the point where it gets large enough that it demonstrates quite a few ideas together. Oh, okay. Yeah, it'd be neat made build your own library for controls too. Right. <laughs> or at least I do have, have a couple the of, videos of libraries in there. Um, just from the, the stuff we talked about before, there's a couple of libraries that you can just drop into your project. If you, if you know how to add a GitHub repo to the package manager. So if you click package manager and click add, you can add either the, um, you can add the core prototyping or commands repository there, just drop it into your project and play around with it. Um, that's about it. I think. Like I said, it's a pity. I would genuinely love to have more public facing projects. It's just one of those things that I haven't really had the time for yet. So. No, I've had the Here's same problem. Thing. Other than uh, tutorial videos and course stuff, it's it's hard to do public things that you can just make accessible. Um, makes it kind of tough. Yeah. Um, the last thing I had on here was just null checks, which is I think relatively simple. Just um, using the null OS, the question mark dot whenever it applies. Um, writer will usually tell you when not to. Um, I think that's a pretty standard, pretty simple one, though. Uh, yeah, except obviously be aware of the um, on game objects. Yeah, or... that's what my note here was that Ryder will remind you of that. So don't do it on game objects because it can, it'll it be wrong, or it can be wrong at least. And I've had it happen plenty of times myself where I did a null check against an object that was destroyed but not cleaned up and then caused yeah. problems and blew up. Um, uh, other than that, um, I have a big plan of the null object pattern, but I kind of think that might be out of scope for this question. Yeah, I don't. I don't know that necessary. I mean, it's 
it, it kind of fits in. I mean, you're either going to do it for everything or not, I think, ideally. Like, or, you know, as the default or not. Um, and I think it, it kind of could fit into here. It's not yeah. necessarily a coding standard, more of an architectural standard, I guess. It doesn't fit into the word, but I think it fits into the um, the, the theme or the idea, right? Yeah. Um, what else can you think of? Anything? Or anybody else in chat have uh, any someone ideas? Someone brought for... up namespaces. We haven't talked about those. Oh, that's a good point. Um, how do you do namespaces in your new projects? I really hate namespaces. I don't hate them. I mean, they're, they're really valuable and I love using them, but I hate the conventions that we've grown up around them. A lot of, a lot of systems um, have that sort of Java style com dot name dot company or dot project or whatever. And I just hate it. It's very verbose and kind of annoying. And if you do use um, namespaces in a standard class library or just a normal project, most editors, writers included, will want you to name your namespaces relative to your folder structure. And I really don't like that because I tend to nest folders very deep to organize things. And I really hate having to conform to thing dot thing dot sub thing dot other thing. And realistically, it's actually one class library. So I will often use my namespaces to indicate like you'll actually see it in my libraries there. Everything under my core library, I call under my name, Jason Story. That's my stuff. And I don't care whether it's Jason Story dot meters or dot state management or dot whatever. That's just my base stuff that works. And then if there is a particular system that moves out to a kind of a larger scope, like I guess state management might be one, I might do Jason Story dot or state management and that would be an entire subsection but i wouldn't have state management dot contract dot implementation dot models dot whatever that's just a redundant s of interfaces so i try to keep my interface chain as short as humanly possible the stuff that you need the stuff that's explicit to this particular concept you're in and that is it if i have more than two or three namespaces from a similar library in one project i consider it a failure like it should be each file should reference one namespace Maybe two. You shouldn't have five or six from the exact same root name. That's just a mess, in my opinion. Yeah, I think I tend to agree. And um, uh, for sometimes people wonder why I use namespaces at all. And I want to briefly talk about it. Um, the primary thing, I, I, or I guess the biggest scenario is, like, I use namespaces with assembly definition um, splits. And assembly definitions are somewhat new to Unity. So before this, would use them to um, logically just do the split. But now we can actually do, like, a full split in an assembly definition where code from one part just cannot access code from another part. And there are a couple of reasons that we would do this. Um, the first is just ease of use so that you're not accidentally using the wrong thing. The bigger one, though, is to make sure that you're not um, misusing something in a really bad way, like having your server-related code be referenced by your client-based code and then be included in your client build even. So we'll use namespaces to separate out where these things are, like if they're on the server or on the client, what type of system they're related to, and... Um, I think that's about it, but it's that in combination with assembly definitions to actually split the code out so that there's a complete logical break between like client and server stuff. Or if you want to have a plugin infrastructure, like you want to have a UI system that's got a plugin part and a non-plugin part, um, we use a namespace for all of the UI elements that it's going to use, and then you just import that one namespace, um, and you wouldn't have access. I to think you mean internal there, namespace. Peter. By the way, what's that? Uh, in terms of interfaces, you can use internal to represent something that is only inside of this DLL or yep. the assembly. That's a good point. Um, yeah, and it's something that people don't generally use very often. The internal, most of the time, people just assume it doesn't mean anything. But yeah, it, it applies when you're using assembly definitions or DLLs. Um, but a lot of time, yeah. to be honest, most time, most stuff is not namespaced in most projects that I see. Um, it's only in bigger ones where things are somewhat strictly organized um they, they just start to see them or or some people just you know have their own setup for them but a lot of times they're just not there for me it comes down to a, a very simple reason why i use namespaces i like to have the simplest most discrete names i can so if i need help in a game i will call it help i won't call it help management help system help whatever i will just use help where possible and it seems 
I'm not the only one with that opinion. So if you have a system where you have help or gun or shoot or these kinds of words, you can be pretty damn sure if you use some third party library and add it to your project, they will have also chosen words like help and shoot and so on. And you're going to have a very hard time distinguishing between the two of them. And there are different tricks like you can preface the namespace onto the entity, but now you're making your code verbose again. But if you use namespaces, you can say in this file, I'm talking about Jason's version of these objects. And so namespaces just let you avoid collisions with other people's code that are named similar to yours. I would try to avoid those without namespaces if possible though. Right? Like if you know that there's already a collision, I wouldn't go create a namespace necessarily just to get around that collision unless it absolutely I, yeah, makes there's, sense. There's a few cases like that, for example, like I won't call something input manager because I know Unity has an input manager. So it's going to frustrate me trying to match mine to theirs or whatever. That being said, for my own internal code, I have no problem having matching prop matching things because I will use namespace aliases for that. But we're I don't think that's a topic that ever really needs to come up in most unit projects. Right. Yeah, I just avoid it because it gets hard for people to know that that is your custom version of it, right? These, especially if you have like your own vector three or whatever, people see it and they don't realize that it's not the same uh, unless there's a very specific need for them. Um, uh, whatever the thing is, and try to just give it a, 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 a very custom name if possible. Um, but sometimes you have a conflict and you have to use a namespace to, to split it. It also prevents it from unknown things that you're going to pull in later that happen to have the same name. It also just a good way to indicate a dependency hierarchy. So for example, I might put something under my name and then my name dot something else. There's sort of an implicit hierarchy there where the, the thing with the dot afterwards is a more explicit version of the thing with the, without it. So I might, for example, put extension methods in the namespace JSON story, but I might put, I might use those extension methods, JSON story dot, you know, loading system or something. And so the implication is that the, the chain of events is that this is a more, this is dependent, this is being depended on by this, based on the, the chain of, yeah, that makes sense. I think it's a, it's a decent way to organize projects. And we're like when I'm doing non-Unity stuff, everything is namespace. So it feels weird when you're working side by side um, and you see all the projects without them. So, but I think that they oh, also and, uh, just confuse the crap out of people when they're new. To be honest, that's the other thing too, right? That's kind of an unspoken rule with a lot of this. A lot of these kinds of, I don't want to call them clever uh, tips and tricks. I will use those internally but I won't use them with public facing code for that very reason. Because there's a, there's an often, there's an oftentimes a problem where if you know a lot of the semantic sugar and the sort of syntactical tricks in a language like C sharp, you can write code that fundamentally confuses other people. If you're using custom indexers and custom collection uh, tools or using um, implicit operators, you can override operators. You can do crazy cool stuff. But fundamentally, if the point is to make your code easier to read, in a lot of cases, this adds confusion. So a lot of these kinds of advanced features, even though I know them and I know how to use them and I like using them in my own code, if the intention is for somebody else to consume my code, I won't use them because it's not worth adding that confusion to somebody else just to prove I know some obscure feature. Realistically, if it's not adding value, I won't add it to me. Yeah, I think that's a, a smart rule to follow. Um, there's a recommendation to add enums to the doc too. So I'm going to add mm. enum based uh, rules for coding standards. See, I don't know. What do you use for yours? I was going to say, do you use, uh, what's your, um, do you use single or plural for the name of your enum? I use plural for flag based ones and single for non. Yep. Same thing. <laughs> So if you can have multiple of the enum value, so it's got the flag attribute over it, which is just like square brackets flag over an enum, um, and it's set up as a flag, then I'll use uh, multiple. So it'll have an S at the end, essentially. Otherwise, I will not. I mean, it'll be singular. For, for me, I, I guess I guess it comes down to sort of like an action-based approach. Um, I, it's really hard to describe. But for me, it's linguistic. If something makes sense, I will say... I will use the, the casing relative to how I intend to use it. So it comes down to like in the context, if I, if I have something called an enum for direction and it's north, south, east, west, 
am I going to be using directions.north or direction.north? What will read better in the context of it? And I guess I kind of... I well, in that case, it. it would be probably be a flag where you have directions, right? Well, that's where, that's where 100% you're right. Like, I've never thought about it in those terms about specifically choosing flag versus not flag, but I think that's a good delineator. I just sort of, I, I went by a gut instinct of what made sense linguistically, but I kind of think that you might be right. The underlying principle might actually be whether it reads well as flag. I've never really conceived of it that way. Yeah, because I think, I mean, you may not necessarily use it as a flag in that case, but you probably would, right? There, You could easily make it's the argument that if you had multiple flag, directions yeah. that it could just be a flag. Um, I'd say any scenario where you have multiple, it's just that 90% of those, it, a flag makes the easiest way to do the multiple. Uh, do you add none to your state or of your enums? Actually, I personally prefer to add it. Some people don't. And realistically, you can actually just use, uh, you can cast, people don't realize this, you can cast enums, integers that aren't part of that value. You've got an enum that goes, that has four values. You can cast the integer 50 to your enum type, and you will get an enum that is technically of your value, just out of range of anything that actually makes sense. In That's technically possible to do. And so because of this, some people use minus one or zero. Well, not zero, but it depends on whether it's cast or not. They will use some value to, to denote a none. Um, and I just don't think that's very cool. So I personally like to have a none if something is state driven. Because a non state or a null state of some kind is fundamentally a valid state. If it yep. isn't a valid state, I will choose not to have a none and I will default the value to one of the states. For example, I won't have none and idle. That's redundant. Idle should represent no valid active perfect state. But I will use none if none is an actual valid state for the system. I think that makes sense. And I mean, I, I'm the same way, like with uh, the none, it's only if it makes sense as a valid value for that thing. Like um, mm. say I've got a player class, none does not make sense, right? There's no yeah. valid reason to have a none player class. There should never be a player that doesn't have a class. You know, assuming that the game you know, requires a player to have a class. Um, so I would not have a a none in there. And I would find that if I needed a none in there, there's probably an issue somewhere else um, where I'm passing in a player class and I don't need a player class and I probably have some other architectural issue going on there. Um, but yeah, I shouldn't be pass I, I, that. So I should have a good default, but um, none makes sense for some things, not for others. Right? Like what particle to play. If there's a big list of particles and you're picking none would be a valid option assuming your particles are in enums right um, or whatever Although even that that's one i'd be contentious on is i tend not to use enums for anything which isn't a uh, atomic list i wouldn't use enums for things like number of scenes in my project or what they are because fundamentally those things change at a rate that is doesn't represent a kind of enclosed loop of state. right and so for me i would use we talked before about having something like public constants or that's kind of how I'd approach things which are effectively an enum, but have infinite possible sizes. Right. Yeah. So I can think of things like um, an item slot, right? Like that would be an enum that wouldn't it wouldn't need a none value, right? Yeah. There's because no... keep in mind, right? Enums represent one of two things. They're either an or or a collection. So if it's not a flag, you are saying it is either north or south or east or west. Or you are saying it is north and south, or it is east and west. Some combination. We're representing, yeah. yeah, we're representing what the value is. And if something isn't one or the other or both, it doesn't make sense to be an enum. So, for example, we talked before about, let's see, you're selecting items. They don't really represent that same chain. Like scenes, I guess, is one of them. If you've got additive scenes, you might have multiple scenes active as once, but it's not really one or the other. I know it's very hard to describe this in particular because it it really comes down to um, is it a finite list of things or is it just a collection of related data? Like the scenes aren't, it's not like you've got a list of scenes and you're picking one for a particular context per se. You are more saying these are the scenes in my project and I want to have a um, kind of a, a cast name to reference. I guess the context mm -hmm. is different. I don't know, can you explain that better than I can? Because I'm having trouble trying to differentiate between um, public const versus an enum. 
the context of how you'd use it. Yeah, I mean, are you talking about like using these as um, essentially almost like constants, right? Yeah. Like Basically, using you know, enums like constants to represent something like a, a scene index um, so you load your UI scene without having to know the the specific name of it or the index yeah. of it. Um, and and, and what I'm could, getting at is I don't like doing that because yeah. if you do that, you end up with scenarios where, by definition, an enum represents iterative values. So there's an implicit e enum value of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And so if you swap the orders around, you're changing the semantic information baked into that idea. So if I had um, an enum of ABC and I decided to change it to ACB, all of the values and indexes I've got in the rest of my code fundamentally have changed. They reference different values than they used to. I have broken the relationship between those two types of things. Maybe. If I just had... I mean, not if you're referencing them by the enum, though, right? True, but there are going to be cases in code where you cast it in... Yeah, it's when you cast it to an int or something and then persist that off somewhere. But I guess my point is, is if I've written ABC as 0, 1, 2, I haven't been able to enforce that to everybody else in my entire system that that'll always be that way. I'm giving them that implicit rule, but I've not enforced it. So the fact that I change it, like they think it's perfectly safe to save it as an int. They might do it for performance reasons. They might cache it as a value in some sort of save file. And so they don't know that I may decide on a whim to swap the order. So I've, I've not, I, I basically lied to them by swapping that order. But if I have um, constant strings or something, I am always saying, like we said before, a constant will always be the constant, that this is perfectly interchangeable. So by using enums to represent a collection of stuff where the order may change, or I might add new ones in between, or I might swap them around, I'm putting myself in danger of potentially lying to people who consume my code. In my experience, the the easiest mitigation for that is to just assign numbers for ones where it's going to matter, right? So instead well, of just yeah, having them great. in the list, just explicitly assigning the values um, so that people understand that if you change these, you are going to impact things. Most of the time, they don't impact things because they just don't get, I'd say, like 90, 95% of the enums, just, they don't get persisted or casted anywhere. Um, but then the ones that do, um, w I'd say any of the ones that do, I tend to explicitly call out, um, the, their values and then we'll inline replace them or something. We can rearrange them and the values are fine, but I generally don't need to yeah. just keep them in, in, in line. That and, does uh, certainly solve that problem. Yeah. But that is one that I have seen before. And I, I'll understand, I, I kind of get how in, in certain circumstances it's okay to use enums for that purpose, but I, I don't know. It's just... There's just certain scenarios where I find that an enum is, is a very distinct type that serves a certain purpose, and I'm very kind of reticent to use it in other ways. Yeah. So another, another example would be um, if you use a enum to represent a value, and it's in a base class or library, and you change the number of values in that enum, you have to recompile the enum, and everybody who's using it will have to, to recompile for the changes. That you've That's you never been an issue for me. No, no. I, I mean, they recompile it, but so. you know that happens automatically, and nobody notices. Or it's never been um, a problem where where it had any impact, right? It's just I, I guess I, I use a lot of separate isolated libraries, where I will build and maintain oh. them differently and distribute them as complete DLLs with the expectation I don't have to change their base type. Yeah, so and if you're separating out like that, and you have that case, then that would, I could see it, but um. When everything's in project, which I'd say probably 99% of projects are almost all in Unity, um, then it, that's less of a problem. I have a question, though. Um, I, it would probably wrap up soon, but I want to ask you just a real-world question on um, uh, some code that I've got and see if you have an, an interesting alternative, too, which is with these... Um, so I've got enums. and Let, let me just do a screen share because I think it'll... I, I will say, sense. though, I'll put a little asterisk there and say I'll probably admit that my aversion to enums might be a holdover from other systems I've worked on, and I probably loosen it up in the context of games more so than... I, sh I, I should probably be more open to using them when I could, but I just, I just, I'm so aware of what an enum is supposed to represent that I get very cautious at the idea of using a very discrete locked list of elements to represent a knowingly changeable list. 
if I know some list is going to grow, I don't like using something that by definition is meant to represent a discrete final complete list of unchanging elements like days of the week. It's understandable. But um, let, let me show you this and see what you have for alternative hmm. thoughts or if you can. Th sure. It's this one right here, Pam. Right, that's the right view. Okay, so we've got this effect type, right? And the, the goal of this enum is essentially there are, I don't know, 100 effects, different types mm -hmm. of things that can happen, and they're stored in data um, as some data, so an ability comprised of some number of effects, right? So it could do damage, snare them, root them, uh, spin some dude around, and teleport somebody else, whatever types of things you wanted to do, right? Any number mm -hmm. of of different effects and each one of them has something that it does. And then if you look at like, um, let's look at stun, this one's old. Oh no, do I not have um, writers, not. Um, no IntelliSense. Yeah, it's, I just reinstalled it. But you can see the way that it works is essentially a, a override this effect type, which is actually following that naming convention where we have the type and the, the property name, right? and then mm -hmm. overwrite it with the, the value here and then have the implementation. And then to just do a quick um, dictionary lookup and find the actual object to do the processing of the data. So if we have a stun, say, hey, find me the stun effect um, and process it with this data, right? Um, and the, the benefit here of keeping it in the CNUM is that I can read the value here, but then we can also easily cast it and insert it into a database as just an mm -hmm. integer and then pull it back out and do easy selects on it and stuff. And if we rename this, so if I rename snare to reduce speed or something, um, everything still works. And I'm much more likely to care about the name of these than I am the value. I really give zero crap about the value of them. As long as it matches the data, um, we're good. I, I do care mm -hmm. about and want to be able to rename these because sometimes the... Um, the thing that they do changes a little bit, or I want to just clarify the name. Um, so uh, the one alternative is, of course, to use string names. But then the second I rename one of these, everything breaks, right? Um, well, this is, yeah. So what I would probably, the only difference I would make if it was me is I would be using a, um, a class with static strings. Same thing. I would With static strings way. instead of an enum? And I would treat it almost exactly the same. The only difference is because I'm using strings, I would probably end up di dividing this up rather than having this like the master enum collection of all ability effects. By having strings, I would be able to have um, things like health effect types and damage effect types and locomotion effect types if I want to. I don't have to. I could have them all in one file or not. But I've given myself the freedom. But that's to not what this is. A couple of those ideas. I, I think that's kind of what this is right here at that point. Um, that's if you wanted but, to sort of refactor this to order it around and sort of say, this is getting too long. I've got 80 or 200 effect types. But I, th I don't um, think it matters, though, just because this isn't like um, this file is one that you would only ever go to if you were adding in a new effect. There's no need to ever look at it because it's just a mapping of IDs, essentially. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I, I, can, I can see the argument. I just... The, and the, the, the value of the enum is that we can iterate over all of the values easily and kind of automate some of that, um, mm. the, uh, the mapping. So if I want to map an effect true. You, you to a value, I don't have to know the name of it or have any mapping of that in code. I just look, at, look it up by the value. I cast it to the effect type basically on load. So just cast that into the effect mm. type enum value and it just maps. I, I guess it comes down to as well, like there's a, there's an implicit connection between the effect type and the code that's calling it to the point that mm -hmm. I imagine some of these, like for example, shader overrides not being used. Um, there's other ones I imagine that would have different things here that are that over time have grown or changed or have mutated. And because they're all part of the same enum, they're sort of implicitly tied. So for example, you might decide to remove line nine now because it's not actually being used by any current ability system. Right. And now your indexes don't make sense. But they don't. It doesn't matter, though. I guess is the point. It doesn't this matter. Is just an ID. Guess, and we can just add that... in a new one. Like the next one that we add in can just yeah. be number nine. But the problem is, though, like there is cruft associated with this. Like looking at it, there are commented out things. There are things which have no uses. Like there are there are code smells that are accruing just by the nature of like being forced into this rigid iterative giant list of things. 
the, the using public static strings are not ideal. They're not perfect, but they, they don't couple any number of things or lists or how you choose to approach them to a single iterative must follow this order. But don't uh, they end me, up with us just and needing to write a lot more code? Sure, but as you rightly pointed out, once you write it once, you're never opening the file again. So that's no, I mean, we anyway. would if we didn't have it like this, we'd need to write all of the code around converting these values. And if we add in a new string property, we we're going to have to either use some reflection and find all of the string properties, or we're going to have to wire it up somewhere else too. We're going to have to do extra, because one of the benefits here is that we don't have to do any extra wiring. We just put in the value, create the class, and it's all auto-wired up. Right, just because it's able to look at the classes, find all of the ones, map them by this enum value, just by iterating over the enum value. Um, well, to be pedantic, like the way I would probably really in brackets do this is I would have a base type like you have there, ability effect, mm -hmm. and I would write a script that would iterate my, at, in the editor, would iterate my project, find all of the things that extend from this base type or interface, and I would read all of the names. I would strip the word effect and I would write automatically a file that's a read that is a static file with static read only functions for each one, but would effectively build my enum for all of the things which implement that interface. So I wouldn't actually have to manually manage a list of enum comma limited things. I would say, make me a file that contains everything. But then I don't have that effect. list of values and IDs to map up to data on the back end. I don't see why not. If, if I said, well, how do I? It, so the data is not being set in Unity, right? The Unity project isn't setting this data. This data is getting set externally by other tools. Okay. So then, but to me, that's easier, right? If I'm if I'm using a stringly typed solution, and I have the word stun is my ID reference in both cases, I know you're saying there's an inherent cost to that casting, but there's no illusion between my third-party editor and my actual game that the word stun represents stun. If in one case I'm using zero as an index, and in another case I'm using the enum, you know, abilities dot stun, and it represents a zero, that's that's giving you that um, that there's a disconnect there, and you're going to have to cast one way to another to keep an eye on that. So the fact that that's an external tool is actually a stronger argument in my mind why you would want to use something stringly typed rather than an enum which is indexed. Like. That's interesting. I feel exactly the opposite. I hate the string type ones because I've seen them constantly be fucking wrong like the value well, is I, wrong my argument is the only reason they're wrong is because people are manually writing them if you write a script which will read your code base find everything that implements effect and build you a single file that comet eliminates all the ones you need you effectively generate that file but still keep the stringly type but what about when that changes I, I add a new effect and now that changes and i'm rebuilding and that, that doesn't file. matter because you're using string types right so it doesn't matter what order they're in yeah, I don't know. I'm, I, I still feel very strongly against storing the, um, the type data as strings, just because I've, I always see it wrong. I always see it. People write stored procs and they put a fucking S on there, or people rename things, and it's just, I don't know. M maybe well, I'm crazy. Like, maybe I'm wrong, and it's certainly possible that I'm wrong. But I just feel well, like honest, it is entirely down to for saving off strings in in a database to represent a selection of things. I used to feel the same way. And to be honest, I used to get really annoyed because I, when I was reading the uh, clean code book, the, the Robert Martin one, um, I was constantly confused about the concept of abstract factories and how people could write factory patterns where you could effectively read into other assemblies and load objects that were never compiled of. How do you expose that kind of connection? And I was watching one of his videos and he used a string type reference the actual namespace position of the object he wanted. So he might have something called shape creator and it would take in a string that would literally take spherical shapes dot circle or something as a namespace reference. Mm -hmm. And I was appalled at the idea because that defeated the point to me of having this really nice um, sort of uh, compiled time safety. If I'm passing in strings that are meant to load up things from an assembly. And I used to really hate that. And I read a long time trying to kind of reconcile this idea in my head. And it's not until I started to think less in terms of um, kind of the comfort of that, that code, I thought more about what the point of that code is, and it's to draw that boundary line. And right now, at least in my mind, 
having a giant list of things in an enum is coupling each element to each other element. And for me, at least, the fact that they're all effects is an incidental side effect. That's like saying, because we're all people, we should all live in a giant file called people. And to me, that's just a conceptual, they're vaguely connected. So an enum that contains every single element one by one is sort of grouping them purely by an abstract concept that we all kind of vaguely agree live in the same category. So to me, having something called, there is a key phrase that represents a stat. It can be any word, as long as somebody knows how to consume it and change it. I don't care what that word is. I prefer to build systems where you take in the string stat ID and just do stuff with it. And how that stat gets built and who owns it and where it lives, whether it's a read-only file or whether it's coming from um, reflection or whether it's written in a text file or whether external tool builds it is irrelevant as long as it eventually boils down to string keyword passed into the stat machine and a stat comes out of it that does something. So that boundary line to me is far more important than grouping them together conceptually. Because I kind of think that grouping is an arbitrary thing we do to make ourselves feel better, but the code doesn't really care. In theory, you should be able to add a, um, a new stat to the game or a new effect without having to consult the other stats and effects, which right now you have. Well, I, I, I can certainly see the argument, and I'm somewhat swayed, but um, I, don't know, I, I also kind of like the effect of having them all in one spot because then I have quick and easy accessible way to find all of the ones that are available. Um, especially when you talk about like stats, having a stat enum makes it easy for me to go in and find the stats. And, and uh, when, I mean, if we dive away from ability effects into just the stats in general, like I would be hard pressed to not use an enum for stats. Mm. Um, I, 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 I could almost be can talked out of it on, some things i'm still not completely convinced on on this scenario but um i think on stats specifically i would be nearly impossible to push over the edge other than the possibility of using like an array for context and i imagine from a purely performance standpoint it might make more sense given that you're doing a lot more stats stuff to do with a multiplayer type experience um for me if it was a single player type game i prefer the idea that you and basically shout a stat into the void and say, update, you know, furry armor stat, whatever that means. It doesn't matter. Like, and if, if it's never been created and nobody even knows what it is, you can just flag it up and say, someone asked to update a stat that doesn't exist. And that doesn't have to be a game breaking thing. That can just be a, this isn't implemented for this character or this context or this whatever. But the problem for me with an enum is I have to write a list that contains every conceivable stat that I'm currently using in my system that is being acted on or implemented. And as is demonstrated by that very stat list, stats have changed, come and gone. And there's this sort of residual information of this stuff that's kind of left or some's returned or new ones been added. And all of this to me is just unnecessary information that's being baked into that system. And the idea of just saying, here, do a stat. And if we decide to remove the stat from the game, some systems may be firing off requests to update those stats. Just don't use them. Just ignore that information, right? You don't have to do anything if someone wants to update a stat that doesn't have a value anymore, that isn't valuable to the system. But if if we've got a system which has an enum-based approach, you have to keep that enum technically in memory just to maintain that hierarchy of value. And like you said, if you delete it, it'll go one, two, three, five, and whatever. And it's not the end of the world, but you are effectively having to pay for the fact that you've removed a stat from the system. But there's you zero cost, the right? The, the, you're getting much more of a cost from just comparing a string one. So you're getting no actual performance cost. I'm talking that. architectural, not like memory cost. Because most even of then, stuff you're just getting like a commented line, which I think is a much smaller um, thing. And, and I mean, really, it should just be a deleted line, and your stats shouldn't be changing that much. And I think that like yeah, but we did, we did just spend about. I'd say two hours discussing about how important every line of code can be in terms of the cleanliness and how much information it gets across. Right, but I think that the alternative is adding a bunch of extra code. I think that the alternative is is bigger. I would like I can see I can see that argument. I think that's a fair argument. But I'm just saying that the idea of having that being okay with actively not used code as one of the elements in an enum is conceding ground that we wouldn't normally concede in the case of saying let's just leave those properties there that aren't being used. 
let's just add comments here that don't really represent the truth anymore. But it, leaving those in is just a, it's literally just a, a, a shortcut, really, because you could easily fix them and adjust them if you wanted to. It's just leaving them in temporarily and then backfilling the spaces. The the cost is mm -hmm. near zero, I guess, is, is the point. Okay, but let, let, me, let me give you a case example. We talked before about the, the value of having multiple people on a team and knowing what's going on. Imagine someone comes across this file who's a new member of your team and they see that ordering and go, oh, some of these are not being used and some of these are commented out and the, the indexes don't add up anymore and they decide it's cleaner to fix the ordering and do zero, one, two, three, four, five, and they break external tool references that have certain indexes represented. I wouldn't expect them to go in and change the explicitly set numbers. I guess I guess I would I would expect that programmers when they see explicitly set enum numbers realize that there's a reason for it and they don't. Yeah, but you've, you've never seen programmers change numbers that fundamentally break code before that should have stayed the same. Has that never happened? It's to you not before? that I haven't seen that. It's that in this specific scenario, I wouldn't um, expect them to do that. And if they did do that, I would think that there was a bigger problem. I think that if the enum is not explicit and they're just in there in some random order. I would be to I would totally anticipate them changing it, but when they have set values, um, I guess I've never seen the case where people went in and did it, and I can't. Mm -hmm. I, I would imagine that most developers would see that and think immediately think that there's a reason for them being explicit and not going and change it. But I mean, I could be wrong, but it's not a scenario that. Um, well, I think again, it's too I'm not even saying it's a common occurrence. I'm just saying that there is an implicit understanding. That these things must always be mapped to these numbers. Yeah, but because it's not they're explicit. A rule that's enforced. I think that that, that you get that from making them explicit. That that should give the implicit understanding that these numbers need you need to think before changing these numbers, and that they shouldn't just be changed. Otherwise, there's no real reason to give them any explicit number at all. Right? If they have one, there has to be. Otherwise, there's just not having them there would mean that it didn't matter. I think. Because it always I, matters if there's a number there. Otherwise, there's no reason to put the number there. I, I can again. I can see your point. I just, I just find that I'm just constantly worried about having to leave implicit knowledge in a system. No, I, I get you, that. I understand. You know, like has sort of implied knowledge there. I think it's yeah, that's true. But I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I'm staring at the code here. I, I forgot I wasn't sharing it anymore. I was looking at the uh, the stat stuff, the actual stats, and thinking like. When these and, and don't get me wrong, matter, like I'm, I'm willing not. to concede that my solution is a lot longer and more verbose code, and it doesn't feel as nice to use. But the, the advantage, in my opinion, of using uh, public static strings is that you are basically moving to more of an event-based architecture. But then how do you do like, so say, so say I made all of these strings, right? And sorry, I know I said we'd wrap it up quick, but if you got to go, it's cool. Uh, well, this is a big time. It's the first time we've had an actual disagreement on a topic in pretty much the entire stream. So, so let's it's say we only story. had these first stats, right? The basic RPG stats, right? And we yeah, made yeah. these, and this was a string, and these were just values set here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And we go, hey, I want to send down all of the stats for the character, or I want to um, modify... This I want to modify stat number seven. How do mm -hmm. I without? Because I mean, if I if I have a, an enum, I guess I can, I can think of how I can do it. But if I dictionary. have an enum, like the Are default for me is going to be just do a dictionary with the enum as the yeah, key, right? Um, dictionary with the string, exactly right. the same. Form. And I'd build that up by going, hey enum, give me all of your values. I'll do enum dot get values. Iterate all over all of those, and then put them in, and then modify them, right? Um, with a strings and a, a static strings or string based properties that map to, I don't know, mm -hmm. how do we do this with like a, a string match? I, I'm not sure I understand. I guess I would argue this is kind of like using the right collection for the right job, right? And for me, having a master list of every stat in the system is probably not as relevant if it's designed not to be relevant, but if it is relevant, it's not that big of a deal to maintain one separately. Because for example, in my argument, I could have 5,000 scripts all effectively modifying string-based stats, but only 10 of them are active in the system. And rather than having to maintain a giant enum where only 10 are being used and the rest are grayed out, I could have a master list of these are the 10 stats which are being used, and I just ignore everything else. But why would you have that scenario? Again. 
But like I said, the things I don't think you'd need that scenario. I'm just saying, if you did, for some reason, you need a master list of your stats, you could write one. We're talking about one file here. It's not. But how do you do it without that. this master list? So say I've got my stats here, right? I've got my character. He's got these stats. It's just these stats, nothing else, right? Mm -hmm. How how do you manage? Well, that's that? a dictionary. Dictionary.keys gives you the entire list of all matched keyed items. In but then, are you just um, you're just filling that with string keys? Well, yeah, the, the dictionary key is strings. Yeah, it's the, each of the names. And it, to me, if anything, that's easier. That way I can go dictionary brackets str equals 10. I get a string. But you don't ever want to do that. Well, it depends on the context of what we're doing. Yeah, I mean, in general, in real code, you probably never want to be writing that the strength is set to some value by like hard coding it into there, right? It should be data driven by something else. Oh, sorry. No, I, I don't mean that's the value of the index of the string. String okay. is going to be the, the value of string is literally the character's str. That's the value of the string. And then you just force to lower everything? Well, it doesn't matter, right? Any comparison I could do, like, yes, I, I would write it lower and I would enforce lower. But like I said, I wouldn't be writing this manually where possible. If it's something that's derived, derived by uh, the list of weapons or the list of events or the list of uh, stats, more often than not, you'll have some classes and I will iterate through it. I'll generate the file. These ones won't because there wouldn't be a file called str. These ones, I would just write a file and have public string, public static string str equals str. And it may be more code, but I write it once and I manage to have each one of these stats without coupling it to external keys. It just is what it is. And if I decide later on that I add a second layer on top of this where there's like the dark version, dark strength and dark stats and dark dexterity, I can add that entire layer on top of it without editing the existing. But how do you just stats. iterate through them? Then are you just building your own iterator if you want to iterate through every stat on a on a character or something? Say you uh, want to look all, at all of the would stats. Would it be in that character's dictionary? That character would have a dictionary of its stats. And you're sending the entire dictionary or you're doing you're just, you just always well, use it, that? You'd only care about the ones that are set, right? If a character has an empty dictionary, it has no stats. If it has but a what, dictionary do you, oh my God, I'm trying to think like, got to be cases i have to check i wonder what the scenarios are where we do iterate over stats i know there are some this, this um, is what bothers me it's like i, I get, I get what pack. you're saying you yeah. don't get the freedom to iterate through every stat in the game but i cannot for the life of me think why would you other than literally displaying it for a debug tool why do you need to iterate through every single stat a person has other than what stats are actively interacted with and if they're the ones that are drawn because they're active in the game just iterate through the keys in that character's dictionary that will literally tell you every stat that that character has an active value. Yeah, I'm going to need to dig through this stuff some more um, and see. I'm trying to think. I feel like there are some cases that I, I can't think of, but my uh, ref, my writer's all messed up right now. So I can't I even also, dig around. I, I will and hands find up. To anybody wondering about this argument, right? I will say mine is an academic one. My argument here is coming from an academic standpoint of application layers. But Jason has a lot more experience writing MMO-style games than I do. So there's probably a lot of practical and performant reasons why he's right that I haven't experienced. And most of my argument comes from scalability of an application in certain vectors. But realistically, we could literally both be saying something that comes from a completely different perspective that don't actually gel. So this one argument, I think, is a very interesting one because it's very different in terms of how you approach it. Like, I would probably be more inclined to lean your direction if I was writing an MMO, because there's a lot less architecture around the concept of stats. And again, I may not, because to me, stats are predominantly event-driven anyway, but realistically, you wouldn't pay too much cost. But I don't want to get into too much of that. Yeah. All I'm saying is, I, this isn't an open and shut, I'm right, you're wrong, for anybody watching. This is more of a musing about the benefits and costs of this architecture. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think you can do it either way. There are a million different ways to build a game. Um, and to build each system and get it working right. So it's just interesting. I, I like talking about these things because it's good to see other people's perspective and how I can work in their ideas with my own and, and mix stuff up and, and make it better. I think it's all, it's terribly bad to only listen and talk to people who you agree with 100% mm -hmm. on stuff because then and, you'll and I will never say that pick up new things and grow. The thing about this too is that this is the only reason this is a, a, a particularly interesting or contentious point is because it's one of the few that's harder to nail down. Like, if anything, it might have been boring how, for the most part, we independently came up with roughly the same answers and same opinions on most design style stuff and most other architectural stuff. This is about the only case where 
due to the experiences we've had and the projects we've worked on, we've come to different conclusions. Okay. I don't know. I, I find this one interesting because it's just it fundamentally comes down to we've just approached it differently depending on which way we came from. Yeah. Uh, and part of mine might also just be not liking to store and send strings in SQL Server. Um, well, I, <laughs> it could have biased me. Right? <laughs> I, I do think that, that to me is probably the linchpin simply because that's what it used to be for me. I used to hate stringly typed. It even felt like a dirty word. Say things should be uh, type safe at compile time. I shouldn't have strings. But if you're willing to open yourself up to the fact that strings are just an information passing method, and if you don't look at it as some dangerous method hog of bad performance, because we both know, right, you can use something like a string as an event and then like typecast it to ints or whatever later. We can do whatever we want at a different layers of the application. To me, the stat concept is just how do I pass information back and forth through multiple layers? And stat being an individual component doesn't need any other cruft or information. Just the word, whatever the stat is, other systems know how to interact with it. And so I think I think the stringness is a very um, contentious argument for a lot of programmers. Because unless you come from like a JavaScript background where you're more okay with duct typing, and I'm not, I hate duct typing, you mostly hate strings. You kind of think they're a... a Kind of a cop out or a messy way to solve a problem because as you rightly said jason other programmers will mess it up they will spell it badly they'll be uppercase or lowercase you'll get into these weird decisions the question becomes is whether that's a cost you're willing to pay and in my mind there are very easy mitigation factors you can trim white space lowercase things and providing you're willing to cache stuff and not have to do these calls every time to me the benefits of crossing boundaries with vague terms much easier than hoping number four always means the same thing to both systems all of the time. Probably yeah. will, but I don't like that risk. I think you can enforce that rule. But it's all good. Um, I, I got to get yeah, going. I got a three o'clock thing going on. I got to head out in just a minute. Yeah, but, um, we've, we've, I think we have enough time. We've been at this for two hours. I think that's yeah, this was a great, stop anyway. great conversation. Yeah. Lots of interesting questions. If you guys like this, don't forget to subscribe, share, and hit the like button and all that. And also go check out Jason's channel and get subscribed for when he starts releasing videos. Very soon, I promise. There'll be videos very soon. It'll be exciting stuff, man. I, I'm excited to see him. And then um, also going to release some info about the conference stuff sometime soon. But I've got to head out, so um, I'll do that in the next stream. <laughs> Good talking to everybody. Good talking to you too, Jason. Thanks, Ian. You got anything yeah. else you want to say before we head out? No, that's it. Thanks for shooting in, everybody. And, and upvote Jason's channel, please, if you're, if you're still. Hey, thanks. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. Good luck.